The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to identify gaps in pursuing a more holistic approach to countering the Chinese Communist Party. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, I'd like to first say that one of our colleagues, uh, Joaquin Castro, is uh, at MD Anderson, that got diagnosed with cancer. And uh, um, uh, let's offer our thoughts and prayers to him and for a speedy uh, recovery. Um, and if you can reach out to him personally, that would be awesome. And uh, anyway, our, our prayers are with him. Um, there's no doubt that the growing aggression of the Chinese Communist Party poses a generational threat to the United States. From using a spy balloon to surveil some of America's most sensitive military sites to their theft of upwards of $60, $600 billion of American IP every year, much of which goes into their military, to their continued military aggression and expansion in the Indo-Pacific. And now CIA Director Burns has recently stated U.S. intelligence has reason to believe China is considering sending weapons, lethal weapons, to Russia. All this ahead of the upcoming meeting between Chairman Xi and Putin next week, where they will surely strengthen their unholy alliance. We are living through one of the most dangerous periods in American foreign policy in a generation. It is a struggle for the global balance of power, and the primary battleground is technology leadership. This is an issue Congress and this administration cannot ignore. I commended the administration for the recent export control rules on semiconductors and semiconductor equipment, and I look forward to hearing the details about your work with the Dutch and the Japanese to harmonize uh, these controls. But I am concerned the administration's efforts aren't as all-encompassing as they should be. Congress authorized the Bureau of Industry and Security with expansive powers to stop the transfer of dual-use technology that the CCP is using to build their military. Yet overwhelmingly, BIS continues to grant licenses that allow critical U.S. technology to be sold to our adversaries. Even those it's designed, uh, designated as threats to national security. In just one recent six month time period, BIS approved licenses worth $60 billion to Huawei and $40 billion to SMIC, their semiconductor company. Both of these companies are military companies for the CCP, and both are listed on the entity's list. The BIS continues to mindlessly green light sensitive technology sales. The CCP has proven they will use our own inventions against us. Look no further than the recent spy balloon that the administration allowed to fly across much of the continental United States. It has been reported Western made components were found in this balloon. That is on top of the recent hypersonic missile test which circled the globe and landed with precision. This was only possible through U.S. technology that was sold to them. This should be a wake-up call to all Americans. I stand ready to work with the administration and with the Democrats on this panel to strengthen our export control systems where needed and why I launched a 90-day review of BIS. We are also falling behind on the ideological battlefield Congress appropriated $325 million to the State Department to counter CCP's malign influence around the world. But instead, that money was used to fund bakeries in Tunisia, electric vehicle charging stations in Vietnam. And at the same time, the CCP continues to invest large amounts of money in developing countries, building bridges, roads, ports, and energy infrastructure all the while growing their influence over, their, over the people in these developing nations. Both the U.S. Aid and the Development Finance Corporation play key roles in developing lasting partnerships and long-term development and trade with other countries. Every day we should make sure people around the world know that our aid is not the debt trap diplomacy that the CCP uses to exploit developing countries. But we are not succeeding. Of the 6.3 billion people living in developing countries, about 70% have a positive view 
of both China and Russia, 70 percent. All the while, the threat against Taiwan grows every day, yet arms sales to Taiwan, those that the ranking member and I signed off on nearly four years ago, have yet to be delivered, despite the administration admitting Taiwan is facing an imminent threat from the CCP. We must strengthen Taiwan's defenses through weapons and training. We will not tolerate any attempts to delay notification to Congress of arms sales to Taiwan. But it's not too late to reverse this trend. As the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, it is my priority to make sure Congress and this administration are working together in a bipartisan fashion to confront this generational threat. That starts with ensuring that we are using the tools we have on the books, like export controls, to constrain the CCP's military and surveillance systems. And I stand ready to work with the administration and those on the other side of the aisle to strengthen our export control systems where needed. We need tough diplomacy and real actions to keep critical technologies and manufacturing capabilities out of the grip of our adversaries. So I look forward to hearing from each of you what you are doing to address the China challenge and what steps you're taking to dramatically shift your agency's priorities to meet this challenge head on. From what I've seen over the last two years, much more is needed. It is time we move beyond the false belief that the CCP will ever deal in good faith. Time and again, they do not stand behind their commitments. The CCP is acting in their own interest and it's time that we start protecting ours. And with that, uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, for any statements he may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And while I do not, first let me just say also in regards, in regards to um, our colleague, Mr. Castro, who has all of our prayers uh, we've got and have talked to a number of members of his staff, uh, and they um, have told us that the surgery has been very successful, that Mr. Castro uh, is hoping to be back uh, after the next recess that we have. He's going to be home shortly, uh, recuperating. And so uh, uh, to him, I want to make sure that everyone knows that every member of this committee is in a, he's in our hearts, our thoughts, and our prayers as he, as he recovers. First, uh, the aggregate, aggregate data regarding license approvals and denials provides no information about the transactions that took place. To use them to conclude that problematic transactions are taking place is both wrong and I believe this ingenuous. Second, our export administration regulations are published publicly and spell out exactly which items and technologies are not allowed to be exported to specific entities on the entity list. Companies generally do not apply for a license when they know it would be denied. So it should be no surprise that we see far more approvals than denials. The current entity list and licensing process gives the administration tremendous visibility into what goods and services are being legally exported. One would think we would want that. An interagency review process consisting of BIS, the State Department, Department of Defense, and the Department of Energy reviews these licenses. The public debate on the issue should be done with this important context in mind. Now, the PRC and its policies clearly present the greatest geopolitical challenge that the United States faces today. And I want to thank Chairman McCall for making this the very first hearing on the 118th Congress. And I thank all the witnesses here today for your service and for appearing before this committee. And since this is our very first hearing, this Congress, I want to remind everyone what this committee is all about. The House Foreign Affairs Committee 
must be at the forefront of positioning the United States for success in the strategic competition with China, as this is the only committee that is focused on diplomacy. Other committees have jurisdiction over military, over our domestic institutions, over financial systems, and so on. Our job on this committee is to make sure that the State Department, USAID, the Development Finance Corporation, the Bureau of Industry and Security have the tools and resources they require to effectively compete with the People's Republic of China. So what does effective competition look like? An effective China strategy is one that invests in the leverages and that leverages our strengths and one which does not exaggerate the threats we face. A smart strategy is not simply about responding to Chinese actions or provocations. It is one where the United States leads by representing a positive agenda and a vision for the rest of the world. If we're simply in the countering China business, we're not living up to our responsibilities to the American people. First and foremost, we must, we must complete and compete diplomatically. Our alliances and partnerships are our superpower and something Beijing cannot replicate. Instead of taking unilateral steps that will be less effective and alienate us from our allies and partners, we must focus on working collectively to isolate Beijing. Our generals are constantly telling me that the State Department helps make their jobs much easier. So I hope this committee will pass a bipartisan state authorization bill and work to ensure that we adequately staff and resource our Indo-Pacific strategy. Second, we must show up diplomatically and stand up vigorously for our interests. We need to work with our allies and partners and in multilateral institutions to advance U.S. interests and uphold a rules-based order. Whether it's about calling out Beijing's genocide in, in Xinjiang, its provocations on the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, or its coercion of sovereign states, the United States cannot be silent about the PRC's problematic behavior. The Biden administration deserves credit on this front. It has directly shared our disagreements with China while strengthening our diplomatic partnerships, whether by elevating the Quad, starting new initiatives like AUKUS, or elevating our relations with partners in ASEAN and the Pacific Islands through high-level summits and strategies. Third, it is critical that the United States remain the responsible player in this competition. We all know that the PRC, what the PRC is going to do. But the world needs to know what the United States will play by the rules. That will remain open to cooperation with Beijing on areas of shared interest and global concern, and that we are trying to keep channels of communications open to ensure that this competition does not slide into conflict. Fourth, we need to recognize that war with China would be a policy failure of catastrophic proportions. It would cost countless American lives and devastate our economy. We must, make, we must make clear that we do not seek war and we will not, and we will work to avoid it. However, we will continue to stand up to the PRC's aggression against our interests. And finally, we must not engage in a race to the bottom with the Chinese Communist Party when it comes to our values. I have been deeply troubled by the spike in anti-Asian violence spurred by the political rhetoric around COVID-19. I was similarly dismayed when one of our colleagues just last week questioned the loyalty of Congresswoman Judy Chu. There is no place for that in our democracy and in our debate. We should celebrate our diversity and safeguard our freedoms to present and clear contrast with the CCP. And what our committee does, it matters. It matters because both the country and the world are watching. And with that, I look forward to today's testimony. And I thank Chairman McCall 
I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I have a housekeeping measure based on our consultation uh, for purposes of Section 4820H2B of Title 50 of the United States Code, premised upon the national interest de determination described therein. I ask unanimous consent that the committee authorize a disclosure of some non-business confidential aggregate data derived from documents provided to the committee by the Department of Commerce that summarizes export licensing decisions concerning those of the, on the entity list as reflected in the BIS licensing data report breakdown document that has been provided to members. Such authorization does not include the disclosure of the applicant names, trademark, or brand names, item descriptions, or ECCN or license numbers. Without objection, so ordered. <coughs> Other members are reminded, uh, the ranking members recognized? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just say quickly that while I do not oppose the UC, I do want to provide some context as to what the data is and what it represents. And I have concerns about whether the information being authorized for disclosure is of utility to the public on its own. In fact, I'm concerned that it can, in fact, be misleading and politicized without the adequate context. So we've asked BIS to provide an explanatory document that will accompany the data being disclosed on the record. And it's important that the data be considered alongside the context regarding BIS's regulatory and licensing process. I appreciate the ranking member's uh, remarks, and um, uh, we just want to see the data. Um, it is never, we got uh, one production of a six month window of time, and I look forward to. Um, your compliance with this committee, sir, uh, Secretary Estevez. Um, and we've had great conversations about this issue. Um, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. And we're pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this important topic. First, uh, Mr. Daniel Crittenbrink is a Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific at the Department of State. Mr. Alan Estevez is under Secretary of Commerce for Industry and security. Uh, Mr. Scott Nathan is the Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. And Mr. Michael Schiffer is USAID Assistant Administrator of the Bureau for Asia. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Your full statements will be made part of the record. And I'll ask that each of you keep your uh, remarks to five minutes in order to allow time uh, for the members to ask questions. I now recognize Mr. Crittenbrink for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, distinguished members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. I'm grateful for the bipartisan approach of this committee regarding our competition with the People's Republic of China. The PRC represents our most consequential geopolitical challenge because it is the only competitor with both the intent and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological capability to reshape the international order. The scale and scope of the challenge posed by the PRC as it becomes more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad will test American diplomacy like few issues we have seen. We will effectively compete with the PRC and are focused on managing this relationship responsibly. In doing so, we've emphasized the importance of open, sustained, and empowered channels of communication. To that end, Secretary Blinken met with Wang Yi, the director of the Chinese Communist Party's Central Foreign Affairs Office, on the margins of the Munich Security Conference on February 18. Their meeting was exceptionally direct. Regarding the unacceptable and irresponsible violation of U.S. sovereignty and international law by the PRC high-altitude surveillance balloon, the Secretary made clear that the United States will not stand for any violation of our sovereignty and that such an incursion must never happen again. We have also exposed the breadth of the PRC surveillance balloon program, which has intruded into the airspace of more than 40 countries across five continents. The Secretary condemned Russia's brutal war against Ukraine, and he warned about the implications and consequences if China provides material support to Russia or assistance with systematic sanctions or export controls evasion. The Secretary also reaffirmed there has been no change to our longstanding One China policy, which is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, and the six assurances. He underscored our fundamental interest in maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. The Secretary reiterated President Biden's statements that the United States will compete and unapologetically stand up for our values and interests 
but that we do not want conflict with the PRC and we are not looking for a new Cold War. At the same time, the Secretary reiterated our commitment to maintaining open lines of communication at all times so as to reduce the risk of miscalculation that could lead to conflict. We are continuing to implement the core pillars, pillars of our PRC strategy. Invest, align, compete. With your help, we are investing in the foundations of our strength and home. With bipartisan bills like the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. We are aligning with allies and partners on our approach abroad to build collective resilience, close off vulnerabilities, bolster security ties, and advance a shared affirmative vision. By harnessing these key assets, we are competing with the PRC to defend our interests and build our vision for the future. We will continue standing up to PRC threats and provocations, whether in the South and East China Seas or across the Taiwan Strait. To its economic coercion aimed at partners in Asia, Oceania, Europe, and elsewhere, and to China's attempts to undercut U.S. and allied technological advantages and exploit our cutting-edge technologies to advance the People's Liberation Army military modernization. We'll continue to support the people of Hong Kong as they confront the steady erosion of their rights and fundamental freedoms. And we will continue to call out the egregious and unacceptable human rights abuses across China, including in Xinjiang and Tibet, and we will hold accountable those involved in these practices. Our Indo-Pacific strategy, by contrast, presents the positive affirmative vision we have for a region that is free and open, connected, secure, prosperous, and resilient. Through our Indo-Pacific strategy, we are building regional capacity and resilience, including to the challenges posed by the PRC by defending democracy and the rule of law, strengthening the collective capacity of allies, partners, and friends, as well as the regional architecture through collaboration with the Quad, ASEAN, partners in the Blue Pacific driving shared prosperity through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, bolstering regional security through enhanced maritime domain awareness, and more. These efforts support the ability of our allies and partners to make sovereign decisions in line with their interests and values, free from external pressure while meeting their economic and development needs. With the resources and authorities provided by this committee and the Congress, we will continue taking concrete actions to meet this moment. Again, we recognize the scale and scope of the PRC challenge will continue to grow. We will compete vigorously with the PRC while managing that competition responsibly. And we remain willing to explore cooperation with Beijing where it is in our interest to do so. In closing, let me reiterate our commitment to approaching our PRC strategy in a way that is consistent with our values, with bipartisan efforts at home, and in lockstep with our allies and partners abroad. There are few issues where bipartisan action is more critical in coordination with U.S. government departments and agencies, this committee, and colleagues across Capitol Hill, we're confident we can sustain the resources and policies needed to prevail in our competition with the PRC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Crittenbrink. I now recognize Mr. Estevez for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify this morning. This is my second time appearing before this committee as Undersecretary for Industry and Security. It is an honor for me to lead the dedicated personnel of the Bureau of Industry and Security in the Department of Commerce as we take on the challenge of the People's Republic of China. As President Biden notes in the 2022 National Security Strategy, the People's Republic of China harbors the intention and increasingly the capacity to reshape the international order in favor of one that tilts the global playing field to its benefit, even as the United States remains committed to managing the competition between our countries responsibly. The NSS goes on to state that the PRC presents the most consequential geopolitical challenge. Given the PRC's capability and intentions, as I told this committee in my July 2022 testimony, I have directed and am currently overseeing a top-to-bottom review of our export control policies related to the PRC. While my formal written statement goes into more detail, Commerce is using our regulatory and enforcement authorities to confront the PRC's military civil fusion program and related efforts to obtain advanced technologies for military modernization, human rights violations, and other activities that threaten U.S. national security. In October of last year, we announced significant, robust new controls related to advanced computing and semiconductor manufacturing. We added new controls on certain high-capability chips, components going into PRC supercomputers, 
semiconductor tools, and items going into the PRC's advanced fabrication facilities or fabs. We also impose restrictions on certain activities of U.S. persons, which limits the abilities of Americans to support the maintenance and operation of these technically complex machines at the PRC's advanced fabs. The threats posed by the PRC's mil military civil fusion strategy and its stated intentions for global dominance and in artificial intelligence are real. Unfortunately, many of the powerful computer chips that come in consumer goods can also be the foundation of systems for mass surveillance in Xinjiang or modeling and development of nuclear missiles and other weapons. So let me be clear. These actions were taken to protect national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. We are not engaged in economic warfare, as the PRC government often claims. Our export controls work best when applied on a multilateral basis with allies and partners, as demonstrated by our 38-member coalition's response to Russia's atrocious and illegal war in Ukraine. Conversations about coordinating substantially similar controls by critical allied countries are confidential due to their sensitivity. I would be happy to brief further on this in an appropriate setting with the appropriately cleared staff. I'd also note that we've implemented multilateral controls on certain items and electronic design software necessary for the production of advanced semiconductors. In addition to these consequential rules, we have been vigorous in identifying and adding entities to the PRC to our entity list, which imposes requirements that exporters obtain licenses approved by BIS and our colleagues at the Department of Defense, State, and Energy before exporting items subject to our jurisdiction. Since the beginning of the Biden administration, we have taken aggressive posture, adding 160 PRC parties to the entity list. Approximately 25% of all PRC listed entities were added during this administration. Finally, we have been vigorous in our enforcement efforts, both through our own administrative and civil authorities and imposing criminal penalties in partnership with the Justice Department. My North Star at BIS as it relates to the PRC is to ensure that we are doing everything within our power to prevent sensitive U.S. technologies from getting into the hands of malign actors. We will continue to review our export control policies assess the threat environment and work across federal government with allies and partners and act to protect U.S. national security. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Estevez. I now recognize Mr. Nathan for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Meeks and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I appreciate this opportunity to testify about how the Development Finance Corporation is meeting the challenge posed by the People's Republic of China as it seeks to expand influence in the developing world. I'd like to begin by thanking this committee for its central role in creating the DFC through the passage of the BUILD Act. DFC launched just over three years ago and strong bipartisan support since then has enabled DFC to build the capacity to better pursue the dual mission Congress gave us, to focus on making positive development impact in the poorest countries of the world and at the same time advance the strategic interests of the United States. We meet this mission by financing private sector projects across regions and sectors. I want to emphasize this point. Unlike the development approach of the PRC, which often burdens countries with unsustainable sovereign level debt, DFC's efforts are directed towards supporting private entities, mobilizing private capital, and through that activity, building resilient market economies. We're guided by the belief that developing a robust private sector is the best way to alleviate poverty over the long term and strengthen the economic and strategic positions of our partners around the world. DFC's investments also carry our values of openness, respect for local laws and conditions, and high environmental labor and integrity standards. That stands in sharp contrast to what the PRC offers. There's no doubt that the PRC has put an immense amount of money into projects around the world through its Belt and Road Initiative, but they're using a different model what they offer frequently comes laden with burdens, not all of them financial. When the PRC's state-controlled entities put money into projects, they often bring their own workers rather than create local jobs and show little respect for community, environmental, or labor standards. When the workers go home, the projects left behind are often inappropriate for local conditions 
and our poor quality. As I travel in our markets and meet with leaders from developing nations, it is clear that many would prefer an alternative to what the PRC offers them. The key is that we need to show up and offer them that choice. That is why you created DFC, and that is what we are striving to do every day. And we've made significant progress in close partnership with you. Last year, DFC committed to financing 183 transactions, totaling over $7.4 billion, a record level of investment and associated impact. This was across our product range, including, including direct lending, loan guarantees, political risk insurance, insurance, and importantly, our new tools of technical assistance grants and equity investments. We're also working across sectors from infrastructure and energy to healthcare and support for small business, pursuing private sector opportunities that improve people's lives and strengthen the strategic position of our allies and partners. In my written testimony, I describe many of DFC's recent transactions of particular strategic importance. I would like to now highlight just a few. Strategic seaport investments are a high priority for us, and DFC recently committed to lend $150 million to finance the expansion and modernization of a container port in Ecuador. In addition to ports, we're pursuing strategic and development, developmental infrastructure investments around the world, including airports, railways, and toll roads. In the 21st century, we also need to think about infrastructure more broadly, making investments to close the digital divide in a secure and open manner. To that end, DFC is supporting companies which have outcompeted Chinese suppliers for cell phone networks, data centers, and smart city systems. For example, DFC recently worked with our Australian and Japanese counterparts to enable Telstra to secure the digital networks of six Pacific Island nations. DFC financing is also promoting access to reliable energy that is cleaner, more sustainable, and more secure. In the last year, amongst other projects, we financed non-Russian gas supplies for Moldova, enabled the construction of new solar panel manufacturing a plant in India, free from the problems of the Chinese supply chain, and expanded our support for a gas-fired power plant in electricity-starved Sierra Leone. DFC is also actively pursuing new opportunities in nuclear energy, and we are working to sustainably diversify the supply and processing of critical minerals away from dependence on the PRC. We recently invested $30 million in the latest round of equity financing for US-aligned critical minerals platform TechMet Limited to support their investment in nickel and cobalt production in Brazil. So to conclude, these are just some examples of the type of transactions that offer an alternative to the activity of the PRC in the developing world. I'm proud of the work that the fantastic team at DFC has done through these transactions and many others. And although DFC is just three years old, we've made great progress in our building on a record year of impact. But I know we can and must do more. I welcome the opportunity to keep the members of this committee informed of our progress. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you Mr. Nathan. I now recognize Mr. Schiffer for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, Distinguished committee members, thank you for inviting me here today to testify on USAID's strategy for engagement in the Indo-Pacific and for strategic competition with the People's Republic of China. As we enter the new year, there's no shortage of global challenges. Russia's further invasion of Ukraine, which has sparked a global food emergency, a climate crisis, which has become a threat multiplier, and a global pandemic from which we are now emerging, but which for a moment allowed autocrats to ride high and seek to control as the regular patterns of our lives were upended. Perhaps nowhere are these challenges more evident than with the PRC under Xi Jinping's hypernationalist authoritarian rule, intent to rewrite for its own narrow advantage the existing global rules and norms. In many significant respects, the challenge we face from the PRC, geoeconomic as much as geopolitical or geostrategic, is unlike any we have previously dealt with as a nation. For USAID, the response to this challenge does not begin with the PRC, however. It begins with our own nation's value proposition, that democracy delivers, and a belief that, equipped with our ideas and our ideals, and with congressional support, the necessary resources, we can drive development diplomacy that elevates democratic norms and supports a vision for a rules-based international order congruent with our nation's interests and values. 
and our results demonstrate our success. 11 of our top 15 trading partners today benefited from U.S. and USAID's foreign assistance as they developed. That, I would offer, is what successful global leadership looks like. Development outcomes, in a very real sense, are where territorial integrity, sovereignty, and a free and open architecture live. USAID does not weaponize development assistance for our own benefit or in a transactional way to the detriment of our partners, uh, as the PRC often does. At the same time, we are very clear-eyed about what, uh, that what Beijing does abroad can have a detrimental impact on our own affirmative development agenda and the well-being of our partners. In response, we are committed to work with our allies and partners to shape the environment in which Beijing operates, and in so doing, advance our vision for an open, transparent, and rules-based world. As we contemplate the challenges before us for the, for the balance of this century, there are four pillars to our approach. First, USAID is prioritizing new development partnerships to accelerate the flow of capital into the investments that are critical for success in the 21st century. USAID's model enables competition, fair and transparent deal-making, free market, and incentivizes investments and creates opportunities for American workers. Through enterprise-driven development, USAID is reducing dependency on PRC debt diplomacy, especially for infrastructure. Second, USAID is improving assistance outcomes through digital technology and open and inclusive and secure digital ecosystems. Our work enables U.S. firms to bring world-leading technologies to developing countries and to drive investment, especially in key emerging markets. Third, USAID is enabling partner countries and local communities to become increasingly independent of and resilient to authoritarian influence. We identify and address malign and corrupting authoritarian narratives, and we amplify the positive impacts of, uh, of democratic governance. And finally, we support vibrant civil societies. We support anti-corruption efforts, human rights, and inclusive locally driven and locally owned development, including gender equality and women's economic empowerment, all of which are vital enablers for sustainable development. In short, USAID is elevating our contributions, doubling down on our commitment, and appealing to the best parts of our rooted history in the countries where we work. That is how we will continue to show our value, bolster American leadership around the world, and outcompete the PRC in the years ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to represent USAID uh, and to work with members of this committee in a bipartisan fashion to advance our nation's interests and values around the globe. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Schiffer. I now recognize <clears throat> myself for five minutes. Uh, to Mr. Estevez and Crittenbrink, um, I just uh, uh, attended the Munich Security Conference uh, where we witnessed a showdown between the Chinese foreign minister and the Secretary of State over the recent spy balloon um, that happened across this country spying on this nation. And then the advance warnings that our intelligence has provided uh, that China is now considering providing lethal weapons to, uh, to Russia. Um, clearly, China is supporting Russia in their war against Ukraine currently by selling them satellite technology, microelectronics, and buying Russian energy. I know that seven PRC companies were put on the entities list uh, with, because they were contributing to Russia's military and defense industrial base. Um, I also uh, commend the Secretary of State for saying, warning China, uh, but I hope that if that happens that the information will be declassified so the American people can see what is really happening. My question to both of you is, what is the precise nature of uh, the, the CCP's support to Russia in this conflict, and what is State and BIS doing about it? And secondly, what actions would deter the PRC from providing these lethal weapons? Mr. Crittenberg? Mr. Chairman, thank you for your questions. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you indicated, uh, the Secretary made very clear in Munich in his meeting with Director Wang Yi uh, the consequences and the implications if China were to provide uh, lethal support to the Russian military for use in its barbaric uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, the Secretary has also noted publicly that in many ways uh, China has been supporting 
uh, Russia's war uh, in Ukraine from the beginning through its dissemination of Russian propaganda and its own use of uh, disinformation to support uh, Russia's war there and to blame uh, uh, inappropriately the war uh, on the West, the United States, uh, and NATO. Uh, we've seen uh, China stepping up its economic engagement and purchases from uh, Russia. And then also, Mr. Chairman, you uh, recognize some of the countries that we, uh, some of the entities rather, PRC entities we put on the entities list for uh, providing the assistance that they did to Russia, including one firm, uh, Space City, that was providing satellite imagery to uh, the Wagner Group. So we've made very clear that we will not hesitate to uh, take steps uh, to hold to account PRC entities that assist uh, Russia, uh, and we've made that very clear uh, to the Chinese. The Secretary certainly did so uh, in, in Munich, and of course, uh, the President and the National Security Advisor have done so. Uh, directly to the Chinese on previous occasions. I think we need to make it clear to China this will not be tolerated uh, if, in fact, it, it is happening. I know it's happening with respect to the seven entities, uh, companies listed on the entities list, but with respect to lethal weapons, that is not acceptable. Uh, Mr. Restavez, do you have any uh, comments on the seven companies? Yeah, it's actually 12 companies. Now it's 12. Yeah, we, we had some back in December that we also put on, okay. plus one that was supplying uh, parts to the Iranian drove program, so 13 if you count that one. Uh, and we've made clear, as uh, my colleague just said, that we will not hesitate to put companies on the entity list as soon as we see uh, our uh, factual data that they are supplying Russia. And we have, we're looking across all third parties, but especially China in that regard. I'm glad you mentioned the Iranian drones that are in Crimea, that the Ukrainians I just got back in the from theater cannot attack the Iranian drones without the longer range artillery. But having said that, components were found in these Iranian drones that were from the United States of America, and also the spy balloon, and also the hypersonic built on the backbone of American technology. We gotta stop doing this. They steal it, we don't have to sell it to them. We got a snapshot of, of your, um, uh, Mr. Estevez, from January 2022 to March 2022. BIS denied 8% of licenses uh, applications and approved more than $23 billion worth of license applications to the PRC companies on the entities list. How does this align with your statement that, quote, we are doing everything within BIS's power to prevent sensitive U.S. technologies from getting in the hands of PRC military, intelligence services, or other parties? Uh, first, let me quickly address the Iranian drone thing. We, as you know, we've put... Uh, companies in Iran on the entity list invoking the foreign direct product rule so that it, parts that are American branded, not necessarily made in America, also can't go to that program. For the uh, point on licensing, you know, of, which of course is an interagency process that uh, is done with my colleagues in defense, state, and energy, we have specific licensing rules. The entity list is not a blanket embargo. So going on the entity list may have a particular rule. And in the case of Huawei and SMIC, there were particular rules. SMIC is now, of course, subject to the rule that we put out in October on semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, the licensing rule, the previous administration that still stands for Huawei, allows things below 5G, below cloud level uh, to go. And you know, I will say that all those things are under assessment. Okay, thank you. I see my time has expired. Uh, Chair recognizes a ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and, and, and I uh, just want to say that because I, I hear the chairman, uh, particularly with the work that the BIS has, and um, one, of the thing, one of the things I think that's important, and maybe we can do this in a bipartisan way, that um, you know, for me, BIS may need additional resources for all of the work that we're telling them that they need to do, et cetera. So maybe we can talk about that at some point and figure out how we can make sure that they have uh, uh, more resources to do, to do all the work that Congress is asking them to do. Um, so we'll talk about that later. But let me ask my question first to Mr. Crittenbrink, uh, sec to the Secretary. Um, I concur that I'm very concerned about some of the conversations that we've had uh, with China uh, contemplating uh, giving Russia weapons. And uh, as uh, indicated, you know, part of my viewpoint is, is to make sure that th that, that is a, 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 a line that uh, cannot be tolerated if they are giving Russia the weapons to 
pursue their, uh, their uh, illegal war. Are we talking to and preparing our allies also so that it's not if there's a sanctions, and that's why I hear part of what will take place is sanctions. So if there's sanctions to be placed if, Russia, if, if China does step over that line, so that it's not just the United States, that if Russia feel, that China feels the full force and power of us and our allies, similarly as Russia is with NATO, EU, and our other allies in fighting the war uh, in Ukraine. Yes, sir, okay. Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you for your question. And, and again, uh, when we look at our invest align compete strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, I think one of the most important pillars and certainly a real focus in the State Department is the align pillar. So we are incredibly aligned with allies and partners and friends, including uh, on the situation of Russia's uh, illegal war uh, in Ukraine. And Mr. Ranking Member, it's been quite striking to me how many partners in Europe and Asia increasingly recognize uh, that a uh, security matter uh, in Europe cannot be uh, separated from the security situation in Asia. So yes, we have been in touch with our key partners uh, in both uh, Europe and Asia on, on this matter. And I think uh, it's obviously uh, everything that happens in Ukraine uh, and Russia's illegal war there remains a matter of significant concern. And we've shared with them our concerns uh, regarding China's consideration of providing this uh, lethal assistance. And I think I'm confident to say that many partners share uh, our concerns. So the other issue that I'm really, you know, when I'm watching what uh, the PRC is doing, the economic coercion that they're having uh, with our allies, and I was proud along with uh, uh, Representative Ami Barra and Representative Tom Cole, bipartisan way, uh, to uh, introduce the Countering Economic Coercion Act of 2023, which provides the President with new tools to uh, to, uh, to provide rapid economic support to partners and allies facing economic coercion from the PRC. Um, so how are your agencies preparing for the next time that we see the PRC economically coerce other nations over, for example, Taiwan? And what counter coercion policy responses and tools are at your agency's disposal for when this happens uh, uh, again, as we saw that took place with uh, Louisiana? Luciana, um, and are there additional authorities you require from Congress that would give you more flexibility to support our allies uh, and partners who have been targeted by Beijing's economic coercion? Mr. Ranking Member, I'll respond first and see if other colleagues want to chime in. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, fully agree that this is a significant threat posed by the PRC. Uh, Beijing's increasing willingness to weaponize many aspects of its external engagement, including uh, its economic engagement, is of deep concern. We've seen a number of countries who've been subject to uh, economic coercion. Certainly, you mentioned Lithuania. That's the most recent example. But many uh, other partners around the world, including Australia, Japan, the Philippines, and others, have been subjected to this. At the State Department, we're, uh, we're developing a range of tools to help respond to this. I know in the Lithuania case, uh, it was helpful that we were able to provide uh, EXIM credits uh, to assist Lithuania. We were able to uh, organize reverse trade missions and the like to assist them. And we certainly look forward to working closely with members of Congress to further develop those tools because this challenge will only grow, Mr. Ranking Member. And lastly, what, what, what does the administration do to support the people of Hong Kong in the face of Beijing's growing crackdown there? Well, Mr. Ranking Member, we share your concern at the uh, erosion of rights that we've seen over the last few years in Hong Kong, which is deeply concerning. We continue to speak out to condemn those actions. We have held to account uh, officials who have implemented the new national security law and other draconian measures by uh, subjecting them to U.S. sanctions. We'll continue to speak out and we'll continue uh, to stand uh, with the people of Hong Kong so that their rights uh, are observed. My time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Chair now recognizes Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Grittenbrink, if I could ask you, um, we all know that China targets certain industries. They've done it with the pharmaceuticals. They've done it in a whole host of other products and issues that, that they would like to control uh, uh, the flow of money and the flow of research. They steal just about everything by violating intellectual property rights. Uh, and, and, but let me ask you the, the question with regards to pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> Where are we in, <clears throat> pardon me, in standing up um, either in countries that are friends or within a domestic uh, capability 
uh, those important pharmaceuticals and those, those chemicals that are all important in the curative uh, aspect of it. And I would include um, uh, uh, antibiotics there as well. We know some of it's transshipped through, through um, uh, other countries uh, from China, but where are we on that? Secondly, nowhere in Africa is the CCP's malign impact more egregious than in the DRC. I've been to the DRC, I've been to the mines, I've been to, not to the cobalt mines, but others uh, uh, previously. And I chaired a hearing last Congress on, as part of the, as co-chairman of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, on the issue of cobalt. And the fact that something on the order of 35,000 children, forced labor for children, many of whom get sick, some die, uh, they don't have any protective equipment, they shouldn't be subjected to child labor anyway. And then the adults, some, something on the order of 200,000, are mining cobalt, all of which goes to China uh, for refinement for batteries. You know, no matter where anybody comes down on EVs, um, you know, they're on the roads, they're everywhere, uh, growing in number. Uh, but the supply chain should in no way be linked uh, to uh, such horrific practices as forcing children into those mines. And I'm wondering, I know there's been a stand-up of some kind of council or some organization. Uh, I don't believe anything has been done and will, will be done until that supply chain is attacked in a way <clears throat> that we find other sources uh, or um, we make sure that all of this exploitation ends. Unfortunately, in the DR Congo, there's a great deal of a buying of the government, uh, and I, I believe that to be true. And, um, you know, when money talks, uh, when you don't have anything called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or anything that even comes close to it, uh, it's easy to buy off uh, a corrupt official. And, uh, and, and finally, uh, on the implementation of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, are there gaps or are there things that we need to be doing to advance further that law? Now, I was the House sponsor of it when it passed. It took years to get passed. Uh, introduced it in 2014. Everybody told me it was a solution in search of a problem. When we finally did it, it was very many days late and lots of dollars short. Uh, but it still is a useful tool, if you could speak to those three issues. Thank you, Congressman. Um, on pharmaceuticals, um, I think the general point that I would make, sir, and it gets at your question about the DRC as well, is that we have tried to make clear to countries around the world uh, that they need to have diverse uh, supply chains. And so promoting the diversity of supply chains gives countries options, makes them less subject to coercion and undue influence. So that is the general principle that animates uh, much of our work. Now, on the details of pharmaceuticals and of um, uh, the uh, activities in the DRC, um, I, I am not an expert on either issue, but I will just underscore our message to countries, you should not be overly dependent on any one country or any one entity for your supply chains because it makes you subject to undue influence, number one. Number two, whether it's countries in Africa, uh, Asia, or Latin America, we do encourage them to understand the implications uh, of uh, their engagements with the PRC, PRC investments, uh, loans, and, and other activities that, again, can make countries subject to uh, undue leverage and influence, which I think is the root uh, of the problem of many uh, of the issues you've outlined there. Uh, on the Hong Kong uh, Human Rights Protection Act, thank you, uh, Congressman, for your work there. I hope through my comments I've indicated how deeply concerned we are by the continued uh, erosion of rights in Hong Kong, the continued harassment and, and arrest uh, of individuals for simply uh, speaking their mind and standing up for their rights. We look forward to working with you uh, and other members uh, to continue uh, to implement the act and to stand up for uh, the values that we hold there. In the final 10 seconds, um, there has been an announcement that Ford will enter into a contract with uh, China or Chinese companies with regards to cobalt. Uh, how can we ensure that none of that cobalt is coming on the backs of, of African children? Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. Perhaps I should take uh, that issue back with me. I'm happy to look into it and report back to you. Thank you, sir. Chair now recognizes Mr. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kittenberg, Brink. Um, China's hot. Um, the Pacific Islands rarely are in terms of the attention. As co-chair, along with Mr. Barra of the Pacific Islands Caucus, I'd like to know now that what lies between the United States and China is the Pacific Islands, and China is certainly making a play there in several different respects, 
Can you assure us that you're giving a high priority to actually getting those compacts completed and renewed? Hopefully that's a yes answer. Congressman, it's an, an emphatic yes. We recognize the importance, obviously, of the Pacific Thank Islands, you. and we certainly recognize, recognize the importance of the freely uh, associated states. You may have seen, Congressman, that we have concluded MOUs with all three of the freely associated states, and we look forward to working with Congress to conclude those deals. Should be uh, front burner. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I would thank you for distributing a sheet describing how China controls our corporations, but there's much to be added. Um, you point out that uh, China forces a change in slightly in marketing of Top Gun as to how it's marketed in China. Now and then a movie is, at, is edited for presentation in China, so we figure China's controlling what the people of China see. No, China controls what Americans see and what the world see by limiting America to uh, uh, American studios to 40 movies going into China every year. What that means, of course, is nobody's going to make a movie, another movie about Tibet because it's not going to be shown in China. No, it means no studio is going to make any movie that offends China because none of their movies will then be admitted to China. And so China, you think we have a First Amendment in this country. In Beijing, they control our studios. Make a movie they don't like, none of your movies get in. Uh, J.P. Morgan is told uh, you better advise your clients to invest in China, 15% of their portfolios, or you won't be doing business in China. And uh, I know that Lithuania is a success, but it was, it's a small country, and we're talking about a, a very small amount of money. There are hundreds of billions of dollars lost by American corporations who, uh, who are treated unfairly in China or that would be lost if those corporations didn't change their behavior in order to meet China, uh, unfairly in order to meet China's demands. And we need a, a program to collect billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions from China uh, so that we can make sure that every American corporation that's unfairly treated either currently or that dares to do something like maybe mention uh, the Uyghurs uh, is compensated for that unfair treatment. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Crittenbrink, Brink. Um, there's a considerable dispute as to whether COVID came from a wet market or came from the lab. The reason for that dispute is that China was absolutely opaque. They failed to cooperate. They failed to come clean. Millions of people died around the world and a substantial percentage of them died because of China's obfuscation at the beginning. Is this, is this, the State Department has done almost nothing to tell the world how China is responsible, not maybe for the virus, but certainly for their obfuscation and failure to cooperate afterwards. Is the State Department going to do a better job of informing the world uh, of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's responsibility here? Congressman, uh, thank you. On the issue of COVID, we have long stated uh, that China needs to do a better job of being uh, transparent. But do, do, do people in India and Europe and South America who have lost relatives know that those relatives might be alive if China and its Communist Party had cooperated with the world in the first few months? The answer to that, I'll answer for you, is no, because the State Department has done very little uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to tell the world. Um, third question, and that is Taiwan. Would the administration support an immediate declaration now that if Taiwan is blockaded or invaded, that that immediately ends MFN for China? Don't American corporations deserve to know whether that would be the case? Congressman, on your, on your last question, I'm happy to talk about uh, our approach to the cross-strait situation in Taiwan. Uh, as I said in my remarks, we're committed to uh, our One China policy, our long-standing One China policy. I'm asking you whether you, people are trying to run companies around, they deserve to know whether MFN for China would be ended if China blockades or invades. Can you give them that answer? Or do they have to fly blind? Uh, what I can say, Congressman, is we are committed to maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan <laughs> Strait. And I we think take, they already knew that. Uh, they, of they, steps they had already to do heard that. that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Mike McCall, for your leadership, and uh, Ranking Member Greg Meeks uh, for this bipartisan hearing on something so important as we understand the significance of the uh, challenge of the Chinese Communist Party. 
also the relationship actually to the war in uh, Ukraine. And uh, I, in fact, my appreciation of the people of China, my father served in the Flying Tigers in World War II. And so it was really, uh, I grew up with such an appreciation of the Chinese people. Uh, he served in Kunming, Chengdu, Xi'an. And uh, growing up, I uh, just grew up with such uh, his affection uh, for the people of China. And so uh, we want the best for the people of China, but that obviously means uh, I, we also want a uh, free and independent Taiwan. And so, uh, and, and I uh, appreciate the recognition a few minutes ago about uh, Lithuania, how they've been taking a lead on um, providing to stop uh, Chinese Communist Party influence in Europe. And I was just last week uh, in uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. They too are working uh, hard uh, to promote the independence of the people of Taiwan opposing the Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, influence. With that in mind, I want to thank all of you for being here today. But I believe the world's in a global competition between democracies with rule of law opposed by authoritarians with rule of gun. Today, the conflict is war criminal Putin's mass murder in Ukraine. Ukraine must be victorious to deter the Chinese Communist Party from attacking the 24 million people of Taiwan. And Ukraine must be victorious to stop Iran from its efforts to vaporize Israel as it develops intercontinental ballistic missiles to devastate American families. With that in mind, uh, I would like to ask Secretary um, uh, Crittenbank um, the Chinese uh, spy balloon endangered the security of American families uh, from Guam to my home community of South Carolina. And yet the President said he advised not to shoot down the balloon on January 28th when it was still over the Alaskan uh, Aleutian Islands and not until over the U.S. mainland. Uh, what was the uh, reason for uh, such a delay? Congressman, thank you. O on the balloon, uh, I've been honored to, uh, to brief uh, the House before on this issue together with a number of colleagues, and I'll, I'll restate here. Uh, we tracked, uh, we detected, we surveilled, and then we took down uh, the Chinese high-altitude balloon when it was safe uh, to do so. Uh, the President made a decision uh, on the advice and in consultation with uh, our military commanders um, that uh, we took the steps to protect ourselves, to mitigate against uh, any threat posed uh, by that balloon, uh, and then uh, made the decision again to take down that balloon uh, once it was safe to do so. It's a massive structure, 200 feet tall. The, the payload uh, uh, underneath it uh, is the length of three buses. So the concern was in the modeling that was done, if you take that down uh, over land, the debris field could be quite significant, could pose a real harm to Americans on the ground, and that's why. The president made the decision to take it down when he did. But we, uh, I can say, uh, Congressman, we also learned a great deal uh, by uh, surveilling uh, that balloon uh, while it flew uh, uh, in our airspace. And uh, we are learning more as we have collected uh, the payload since we well, took I, it to down. To me, it's, it's very disappointing. It was uh, a threat to my constituents. I represent Fort Jackson. I represent Savannah River Nuclear Laboratory. Uh, to have uh, a spy balloon come over uh, our state, uh, it, it's just, uh, it's inconceivable. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Governor Greg Gianforte, uh, Senator Steve Daines, uh, Congressman Ryan Zinke have all said that they would have welcomed to have the balloon shot down over Montana uh, as being uh, only a threat to prairie dogs. And so uh, it, 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 I just find that inconceivable. And I want to ask you um, if you could provide, and I've asked and not been given the information, what was the exact trajectory over South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, I, I would like to know uh, uh, what counties uh, the balloon traveled over. Uh, and uh, for some reason, that has been called classified, which uh, it's on opensecrets.com. But uh, it, this needs to be revealed to American people and what a threat this was. And I uh, sincerely disagree with you that um, the thought of shooting it off of, down off of Surfside Beach, South Carolina, uh, into the ocean. Uh, it should have been uh, recovered in some way so that uh, we could find out what type of threat there is from the Chinese Communist Party. And with that, I yield back. Congressman, thank you. Again, I do want to underscore, as I did in my opening statement, that China's uh, 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 introduction of this high altitude surveillance balloon uh, into U.S. sovereign territorial airspace was irresponsible and unacceptable, full stop. But uh, as I indicated, we tracked it from the beginning. 
we made an assessment of how to mitigate uh, the risk and the determination of the president and our military commanders was that it was not safe to take it down until it was off uh, the waters of South Carolina. When we did, and in the water, we were able to uh, recover the payload, and I'm confident we'll learn more uh, from that. Chair recognizes Mr. Bira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I've said this uh, a number of times in my capacity as the chair and now ranking member on the, the subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific. You know, if we think about the geopolitical order in the 75 years post World War II, they really you know, it really was you know U.S. led, but peace, prosperity, um, lifting you know millions out of poverty yeah. and creating stability and you know prosperity for China as well in, in that. But there's no, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing because there's no questioning you know, where a decade ago we may have hoped as China developed a, a broader middle class, an entrepreneurial class, they would go in a, a direction of you know, more freedom and openness and open markets. Xi Jinping's um, policies have taken Beijing in a very different direction, and we don't have to guess that, that direction. And it really does set us up for, you know, competition's fine, um, but the hope is to avoid confrontation. And much of this is, you know, led by, you know, the Chinese may say, well, it's the United States changing this. It isn't. It's China changing the calculus here. You know, the aggression in the South China Sea has changed the calculus in, in the South China Sea. The aggression across the, the Taiwan Straits, um, human rights violations in Xinjiang, you know, what they've done in Hong Kong. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the ranking member touched on um, economic coercion and, you know, how they use those tools of coercion. Um, it really does mean a whole of government approach, not just um, here in the United States, but you know, I applaud the administration for the, the alliances and renewal of you know, the elevation of the Quad Coalition to the leaders level, certainly incredibly important. Um, you know, partnership around AUKUS, um, incredibly important for maritime security. Um, you know, I was just in Japan last week and you know, applaud um, Prime Minister Kishida's administration efforts to get to 2% of GDP um, to increase their self-defense capabilities. Um, again, the hope is to avoid confrontation, but given the realities that we see in the Indo-Pacific, hugely important. Um, Secretary Crittenbrink, I, I applaud um, and hope we get the compacts um, done as quickly as possible and the renewed interest and focus on the Pacific Islands. Um, let me touch on the economic coercion um, component of it. And, you know, the chairman t or the ranking member touched on the, the bill that we introduced last week in a bipartisan way with, with um, Congressman Cole. Um, that builds on a, a bill that we introduced last Congress, the Countering China Economic Coercion Act that I introduced with Representative Wagner that was signed into law by President Biden. That particular bill um, looks at how we can... Um, engage with the, the private sector on issues um, related to PRC economic coercion and how we can bridge that gap between the, the public and private sector. You know, Congressman Sherman touched on you know, some of the coercive tactics you know, that were used against our film industry, you know, used against the NBA players um, and, and the, the NBA as well. I'd just be curious, and maybe this is a question for commerce or state, you know, how should we think about the, the partnership across government and the, the, the private sector to make sure we've got tools and resiliency to, to counter some of these course of behaviors? Maybe um, Se Secretary Estevez, if, if you want to touch on that or. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, well, not in the area of export controls in general. Uh, you know, first of all, go back to the point of what do we tell companies? Uh, when companies come to see me, I point out the dangers of reliance on single source supply chains uh, and the need to diversify. You point out what happened uh, to companies that were operating in Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine and how they had to pull out. And so companies need to take stock of their own risk calculus, and I believe they are all doing that, uh, which will help all of us, quite frankly, as they diversify. Uh, <coughs> Um, the other thing we need to look at is things like chips, uh, which you know, my boss is rolling out today. Uh, very important for bringing technology and important advanced technologies back to the United States or working with our friends as well uh, so that we are not relying on China for such things. Secretary. 
Well, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you for your comments. Again, I'll reiterate, we're committed to, to uh, continue to step up our engagement across the Pacific Islands, <coughs> including the compacts, and I know the special envoy, presidential envoy for compact negotiation, Joe Yoon, is, is uh, working on that as we speak. Um, on uh, economic coercion, I, I do agree that we do need to work in partnership with the American private sector. I know as a diplomat overseas, I'm incredibly proud to represent the world's finest private sector. You look at the Indo-Pacific, two trillion dollars in trade flows between the United States and the Indo-Pacific, a trillion dollars in U.S. investment, and almost a trillion dollars in investment from the region in the United States. This is a vitally important economic uh, trading and investment relationship, and we look forward to working closely with our private sector to make sure uh, that we stand up for our values and for uh, American workers, uh, but also to protect uh, critical technologies as well. Right. Chair recognizes Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Crittenbrink, I want to take you uh, down a stroll down memory lane here to fall of 2019 when China realized their first case of the Wuhan virus. Now, it wasn't until January of the next year until they reported it some weeks or months later. And then in February, their top bioweapons expert took control of the lab. Now, the mantra from the press and from the party in the current administration was is that it occurred naturally. And of course, people like me, and speaking on behalf of myself, but the millions of Americans who saw all the evidence in front of them that pointed to the lab as opposed to it occur occurring naturally, those people were vilified in the public. And the new administration used the information to frighten Americans and confuse them and to distort the facts. Based on that, I'm just wondering, um, did you, does the State Department have any irrefutable evidence that the Wuhan virus came from the wet market in China? Irrefutable evidence. Do you have any? Congressman, I, I would point to comments that, that National Security Advisor Sullivan made on Sunday. He, he stated that there are a variety of views in the intelligence I know community. there are a variety of views, but, but the American people have been taken for a ride for two years, more than two years over this, and I want to know what evidence the State Department or you have that is used to debunk people's opinions based on what they see and what they know and what is reported as fact. What evidence do you, do you have a bat from, from the wet market? Does the State Department have one of these bats? Congressman, uh, I'll state again, there, there is not a definitive answer that has emerged from the U.S. Intelligence Committee on this question. I'm so, not asking. Some about, elements I'm of the I.C. I'm not asking, sir. Sir, I'm not I'm asking about differences of opinion. You work for the State Department. You're yes, the undersecretary, right? You're, in, you're almost in charge over there. And the State Department speaks for the United States of America. And Americans across the country were ridiculed and vilified for having a difference of opinion. So with all due respect, sir, what facts do you have? Do you have the pangolin where the virus jumped from the pangolin to a, to a human? Do you have it? What facts do you have? Do you have any facts whatsoever to support your claim that the virus occurred in the wet market as opposed to the Wuhan lab? Any. Well, Congressman, again, I'll state, if you look at what uh, elements of the U.S. intelligence community have said, some have pointed to say they come down on the question that uh, it looks like it was naturally occurring. Some have come down uh, on the other side of that. Some have said we don't have enough evidence to judge. Again, I will say in conclusion, the intelligence community uh, does not have a definitive answer on the COVID origin question. President Biden has directed from the beginning of this administration to take all necessary steps, uh, including uh, all elements of our intelligence community to get to the bottom of it, but the, the, the okay, candidate assessment. Okay, fair enough. If there yes, are sir. difference of opinions, then what authority does the State Department or this government have to refute the opinions based on facts that we do know? Because there are no facts at all that it occurred in a wet market. There are wet market outside of Wuhan, right? There, there are zero. I, we all know that, right? But there are there's plenty of circumstantial evidence, if not, if not more, because a bunch of it was destroyed. We know they destroyed the samples in the lab, right, so that nobody could see them. But if, it's, but if that's the case, will the State Department at least acknowledge 
acknowledge that they were wrong and apologize to the millions upon millions of Americans that they, that they disparage for their opinions based on what they know happened in 2019 in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Will the State Department acknowledge it and apologize? Will they ever do it? Congressman, what I will acknowledge and commit to is to doing what the President has said, that we'll use uh, all elements, including in the IC, to get to the bottom of this. But as we and stand right now, the there is not a definitive answer that has emerged Mr. from the Secretary, Intelligence Committee. Mr. Secretary, when yes, they sir. finally do get to the bottom of it, if they ever do get to the bottom of it, knowing that the Communist Chinese destroyed a bunch of the evidence, knowing that, if they do get to the bottom of it, and they do determine that it is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, will they apologize? Will this State Department apologize to the American people it disparaged? Congressman, the President has directed his team that we will share with Congress and the American people uh, what we learn. I'll just reiterate, there's not a definitive answer that has emerged from the intelligence community on this question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. You. And let me just say, we, uh, in, when we were in the minority, we published a report finding uh, by a preponderance of the evidence that did originate from the Wuhan lab. And I feel the latest intelligence has confirmed uh, our opinion, and that can be found on the House Foreign Affairs website. With that, the uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking you, uh, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks, for giving us the opportunity to explore this important issue. And I really want to thank the four witnesses, both for their service to our nation, but also for helping to inform today's discussion and for being with us. From the genocide against the Uyghur population in Xinjiang to the 2021 crackdown on democracy and the rule of law in Hong Kong, we've seen a glimpse at the values of the People's Republic of China is trying to impress upon the world. A rejection of human rights, a commitment to authoritarianism, a silenced press, and the abandonment of the rule of law. Those values are antithetical to our own and must be confronted globally by American leadership, diplomacy, and investment. And in taking up this important work in today's hearing and those uh, uh, in the future who are working on these issues, it's my hope that we can do so in a way that doesn't promote or advance xenophobic anti-China rhetoric, which we've seen lead to an alarming increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans across the country. We simply cannot allow this committee or others to give that rhetoric any oxygen because the consequences are too dangerous and too serious. I want to begin with you, Mr. Schiffer. Um, the PRC's repression of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities is global in nature, and we've seen the PRC pressure governments in the Middle East and in South and Central Asia to cooperate with or overlook its campaign to intimidate, harass, detain, and deport Uyghur refugees and the diaspora members around the world. And there was a recent Wilson Center report that documented uh, over 5,000 cases of Uyghur uh, Uyghurs facing intimidation and, and, and worse. So I'd like you to speak to what USAID and the State Department are doing to urge nations to prevent the harassment and detention and deportation of Uyghurs and other, other ethnic minorities uh, on their soil in the face of this kind of tremendous PRC pressure and really demands that they're making and what role we can play in Congress in supporting the work that you are doing. Thank you very much for that, uh, that, that question. Um, you know, we, we have uh, at USAID, working with our, our colleagues at the Department of State, um, just, uh, excuse me, uh, just launched a, a new um, international uh, religious freedom and human rights uh, assistance activity uh, to work with uh, members of the, uh, the Uyghur community um, outside of the PRC uh, and to try to provide them with the support uh, that, that they need uh, navigating this uh, very, very um, oppressive uh, environment that the People's Republic of China is trying to create for them, both inside the PRC, but also, uh, as you so, so rightly pointed out, uh, all around the world. Uh, we regularly uh, engage with our, our uh, partners and allies uh, in conversations about what their governments uh, can do as well uh, as we look to align, uh, as uh, Secretary Crittenbrink offered, uh, to make sure that uh, the international community is um, fully uh, engaged uh, on this issue uh, to uh, speak out uh, on the PRC's genocidal actions in, uh, uh, in Xinjiang and to support uh, the Uyghur community uh, where, wherever they may be. And is there anything we should be doing additionally to support that work? Well, I, I certainly think the congressional leadership over the past uh, several years, including the legislation, uh, that the House has, uh, has, has moved forward uh, has been an important part of creating the momentum 
uh, that we need to be able to continue to press back uh, against the PRC. Um, so I would certainly look forward to working with you uh, and your colleagues uh, to continue to raise voices on this issue. Thank you. Congressman, uh, Mr. Congressman would it be okay if I uh, address that question as well? I did just want to underscore that um, in response to the, the genocidal actions uh, in Xinjiang, the United States has designated 12 persons uh, under global Magnitsky san sanctions. We've imposed visa restrictions on another seven. We've coordinated with the EU, UK, and Canada on the imposition of sanctions as well. That would be the first point, Congressman. The second point, any time we learn uh, of Uyghurs who have been detained or harassed uh, abroad and are th threatened with a uh, forceful uh, involuntary return to China. We've engaged with those governments to try to stop that action. We will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nathan, just quickly, I know uh, there's a lot of evidence that the Belt and Road Initiative is sort of running out of steam and financing for projects is becoming more difficult. Uh, many countries are now struggling to repay loans. Um, would you just speak to what the uh, Development Finance Corporation is doing to finance projects that are in this position so that countries have an understanding that there are other options out there uh, to deal with their needs? Thank you for the question. Uh, for sure, when I travel and meet with uh, leaders in the developing world, they're actively looking for an alternative, and we need to be there to present it, uh, whether that's in the Indo-Pacific, Africa, Latin America. Uh, countries are actively <coughs> seeking uh, alternatives that are high standard, that reflect values of the um, uh, private sector and uh, don't burden them with debt. Uh, I think they've found out that often projects uh, that are funded by the Belt and Road Initiative or by the PRC, uh, state-controlled entities, turn out to be inappropriate for their local conditions and uh, frequently not of high quality um, uh, and leave them with uh, burdensome debt loads. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. I want to talk diplomacy because that's what we do here in this committee. And hands down, one of the biggest things asked, I think probably to all of us, either side of the aisle, is what are you doing? We see uh, China visits Russia, Russia pulls out of New START. We see balloons flying over America. We see China testing hypersonics. And the question constantly is, what are you doing? And one of those forms of diplomacy that we have to deal with this is the entity list, correct? I mean, that's one of the ways that we help deal with this to say, listen, you can't get the nut, the screw, the bolt, the epoxy, the semiconductor, the, the pencil to draw it up if that's what we decide. You can't get what you need, China, Chinese uh, you know, Communist Party company. You can't get what you need to make those things that threaten America or our allies because we're going to put you on a list, correct? Correct understanding, Mr. Estevez? I wouldn't call it a tool of diplomacy, but correct understanding. You wouldn't say, I mean, I mean, I look at diplomacy in this way, and I always ask this question is, does our support equal our policy goals? So if we're allowing somebody to get something, that's a form of support. If we're stopping them from getting something, that's, those are diplomatic efforts, right? Close. All right, well, I'll take that. You said close. We'll say it's close. So. Sir, Mr. Estevez, looking at those, those entity lists, I'll call it a form of, of diplomacy, whether we're going to let Chinese Communist Party entities get the supplies that they need to build things that are a threat to America, America's allies, and Americans. In order to do that, this list, how many have you published in the last year? How many have you recommended to go up to the, the Federal Register? We've I know you a, talked about 12 recently. We've but. put 160 entities on the entity list since the beginning of this administration. That's about a quarter of the entities uh, in the PRC, and the entity list goes back to the 90s. Very good. So when we look at this, and, and I want to bring Wendy Sherman into the conversation and say, you know, it's been the conversation, I believe, from Wendy Sherman that state agrees with the action, you guys having – the, the, the end user review for that. But there's really somebody higher than you all, and that's uh, whether it's Mr. Crittenbrink or Wendy Sherman or Blinken, they might ultimately decide if those end user reviews are going to be put into the Federal Register, correct? There's an interagency process. We never go up that high, to tell you the truth. Only 1.1% of discussions over licenses or entity lists 
have even go up to the assistant secretary for adjudication because usually there's pretty good consensus on what goes on the list right, based on the process. evidence that we have. There's a process, but even if the, you all recommend that that, that that review goes forward and put it on the register, if Secretary Blinken or Mr. Crittenbrink or Wendy Sherman decide they don't want that on there, that's not going on there, is it? The process actually flows a little differently than that. Mr. Crittenbrink, would you like to we have the to? vote, we put people on the list. Congressman, yes, thank you. Uh, I think we collaborate exceptionally well with our colleagues uh, at Commerce, and not just Commerce, but Energy and DOD as well, who are also part uh, of this process. Uh, and our goal is to do exactly what you've outlined. The entities list is de designed uh, to prevent China or other actors from uh, acquiring U.S. technology inappropriately uh, or to use for their military modernization in ways that would threaten our interests. So, so let's we're very supportive of that effort. Question on that then, yes, sir. between since I'm glad we have both of you sitting here. So, how many PRC entities have passed that end user review, uh, the committee, that have not? been published yet? I'm not aware of any. None? None. Very good. That'd be great to hear. Do you, you want to consult with your staff and make sure that that's the case? Anybody behind you? I don't have to do that. Mr. Crittenbrink, are you familiar with uh, any that Ms. Sherman might think that uh, she agrees with the action but doesn't agree with the timing because it might piss off China? Congressman, I, I would say that once uh, a proposed entity listing is, is, appro is approved uh, by these four agencies, this regulatory action in the ERC, uh, it goes on uh, the entity list. That, that is the process. It doesn't just go there. You all have the opportunity to pull that back as higher leadership in the State Department. I think what I would say, Congressman, is that we feel like our job when we, the reason why we have this consultative body is to sit down these four agencies and to think through all of the implications. Is this proposed action going to achieve our goals? Uh, is it potentially going to inadvertently harm our own interests or the interests uh, of allies and partners? We have to think through uh, all of those things. But once, once we reach consensus uh, and we vote, uh, those actions go forward and are published on the entities. Thank list. you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our panelists for, for coming today. Uh, Mr. Crittenbrink, I wanted to start with you. I, I guess I just wanted to ask you, how central to the work that we're trying to do in the Indo-Pacific, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, how important is coalition building uh, to our strategy and our efforts there? Well, Congressman, I would say it's absolutely vital. It's central to what we do. Uh, as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific, I spend the vast majority of my time and my Bureau's time on building the coalitions that you're talking about and what we refer to as building the collective capacity of our allies and partners and friends to work together with us to support the rules-based international order and to counter all challenges, including those posed by the PRC. It's absolutely, absolutely central, and I would argue it's the most important thing that we do. I uh, very much agree with you that it's so central and, and to the point you said, perhaps the most important thing that we're trying to do. And I think this committee, we've talked a lot about in the context of Ukraine, just how central that coalition was for our efforts uh, over there. Uh, but what we've also recognized is that in many ways, our coalition in the Indo-Pacific, it's, it's much more fragmented and segmented in some ways than it is over in the transatlantic. So I guess I want to ask you, what does this kind of coalition building 2.0 look like? What is this next level that we can do to try to take that and add some greater gravity to it and pull it together? Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, again, we, we talk about building a lattice work of interlo an interlocking web of relationships. We start with our our treaty allies, our five treaty allies uh, in Asia, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, the Philippines, and Thailand, I would argue that our alliance relationships are stronger than they've ever been before. And we're working together, not just in bilateral ways to improve our security, but increasingly in trilateral and uh, multilateral ways to advance our shared interests, not just in the security realm, but in economics in terms of promoting our values. And then beyond that, I'm sure you've seen uh, Congressman uh, the president hosted uh, uh, an un unprecedented uh, summit with uh, the leaders of ASEAN last year. He hosted another unprecedented summit with the leaders of the Pacific Island countries. Uh, we've formed uh, new uh, informal mechanisms such as the Quad, the Partners of the Blue Pacific, 
uh, again, forming these interlocking webs of, of, uh, of relationships that we think are absolutely vital. And trying to build that trust there and that partnership there, it's so important. Absolutely, but, and but, sir, I feel like uh, my number one duty every day and the duty of my colleagues is to demonstrate the credibility of our commitment to the region and to our partners to let them know that they can count on us and let them know that we'll all be better off, more prosperous, more secure if we work together, so there, including encountering threats from the PRC. There, there's a little bit of a debate here about how best to be able to build this coalition. I want to your thoughts on it. I've had a number of people come to me and say we should be applying greater pressure to some of these partners that we're working with in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, pushing them to, to more definitively choose between the United States and China. And I guess I wanted your thoughts on whether or not that would help or hurt your ability to build the coalition you need. Well, uh, Congressman, I would say, in generally speaking, uh, we don't try to force countries to choose. They tell us that they don't want to choose. Most countries in the Indo-Pacific don't need an education on the threat posed uh, by the PRC. What they want to know is how can they work together with the United States and increasingly together uh, in these interlocking webs of relationships to uh, advance our, our shared interests. Uh, the way we look at it is we're not asking countries to choose. We're working to make sure countries have choices and to make sure they can make their own sovereign decisions free from coercion. And if we do that, uh, I'm confident that we will prevail in this competition and we'll continue to preserve uh, the free and open region toward which we're working. One thing that I've heard when I was uh, out there in the region talking to some of our vital partners there is they, they do have concern about some of how we're approaching vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, our rhetoric, our posture. And I guess some of their concern was saying that they, they really want to work with us and continue to be a partner, but that may be more difficult for them if they feel like or see or is perceived like the United States is the instigator for aggression or provocation uh, in that relationship between the U.S. and China. Do you, do you hear the same from partners that you're talking to? I do, Congressman. Look, um, I think it's important that we always demonstrate that the United States is a responsible actor, that we are committed to uh, the rule of law, to peaceful resolution of disputes, committed to uh, the rules-based regional order. And when we do that and when we work together with our partners, I think that's when we uh, are most effective. And I, I think it's quite clear across the range of issues we've discussed today, I think it's quite clear uh, w which party is taking steps to undermine the rules base. And I think that's something we can highlight while underscoring that we are that responsible actor. Thank you. Yes, I yield sir. back. Chair recognizes Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and thank you for uh, you and the ranking member holding this very important uh, bipartisan hearing related to uh, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Secretary Estevez, in your testimony, you state that in FY 2022, BIS and its interagency partners approved approximately 69.9 percent of license applications involving the PRC and denied or returned without action approximately 30 percent of such license applications. How many of those BIS licenses were approved for companies on either DOD's 1260H list of Chinese military companies or Treasury's Chinese military industrial complex companies list? Uh, unfortunately, uh, Congressman Barr, I'd have to get you that information, which I'll be happy to. Does BIS out. have that information at, at your fingertips? Well, when, when we vote through the interagency, obviously defense can bring, first of all, defense can propose anything they want. Well, defense can raise the concern over any license based on their list. Well, here, here's the concern I have, and I, you and I have had a good conversation about this. The lack of coordination and the lack of visibility across agencies, big problem, big problem. How important is it that commerce entity list designations be coordinated or be cross-referenced by OFAC or Treasury or DOD for purposes of sanctions to prevent American investors from financing entities tied to the CCP or these Chinese military industrial complex firms that are still included in emerging growth index funds, either on U.S. exchanges or foreign stock exchanges, or even through private equity or credit investments? Um, so well, there's a lot to unpack there. Obviously, investors should be looking at all those lists. As far as coordination between myself, the Treasury Department, and the Department of Defense, we actually have pretty excellent coordination going on right now. Certainly, uh, with regard to what we're doing. Well, I'm not okay, sure we do. Sure. Sorry, reclaiming my time. I'm not sure we do, because the OFAC list uh, uh, that's uh, subject to the EOs, yeah. uh, they're they're not aligned, frankly, with your entity list, the, and and certainly not 
with uh, some of these other lists, the military end user list, the unverified list even. And, and here's what I would just say uh, editorially, and we're going to be looking at this in the Select Committee on China and in this committee and in the Financial Services Committee on which I serve. Restrictions on capital flows to China should be aligned with our export controls regime and limited to capturing outbound investments that circumvent the, ex the spirit of existing export control rules. In other words, why should restrictions or notification regi regime on outbound American investments in China uh, uh, not also be applicable uh, to what's on an export control list? And, of course, we're working on an outbound investment uh, program, and I know that you know, the Congress is looking at that as well. Do, do you uh, have visibility into uh, uh, PRC entity list companies that remain uh, in uh, index funds listed on U.S. or other exchanges? I do not. That's what we need. That's what we need. That's what we don't have right now. So we need list coordination because if we're worried about uh, export controls, if we're worried about companies that are on this entity list, but American investors are financing, unwittingly financing these same companies, that's a problem. That is a gap that we have that we, we need to fix. Uh, and I appreciate your attention to that. Uh, Mr. Nathan, and also, w b believe me, we're going to be talking to Treasury about that problem uh, because it's you're doing a good job. You've got a good entity list, but we need coordination so that we're not unwittingly financing these technologies, even if we have export controls. Uh, uh, DFC, uh, Mr. Nathan, we've talked about this. Uh, DFC must prioritize low and uh, lower middle income economies defined by the World Bank, but there's some higher income economies where uh, Belt and Road is alive and well. Would you like to have the capability of going into some, some of those higher income countries that are strategic, like Panama, uh, where China is all over the canal? Thank you for the question, and I appreciate our previous discussions, uh, Congressman. Um, the, Congress has provided us the opportunity specifically for energy to operate in high-income countries in Europe through the European Energy Security and Diversification Act. If uh, Congress moved forward other legislation, we'd obviously work together uh, to make sure that that was aligned with our objectives and our mission under the, the BUILD Act. Uh, as you and I have dis uh, discussed previously, some of the World Bank income classifications are a little bit clumsy in terms of uh, the countries where we can operate. And last question to you. Uh, due to budgetary treatment of DFC equity investment, DFC has not been able to fully unlock this tool. Uh, how can we help you with that? Oh, excellent question, and thank you for asking it. Uh, equity is a very important tool for us to be forward-leaning on risk, to be able to fund infrastructure projects, companies, and, and other uh, projects that um, meet the needs of the countries where we're operating and give them the choice that they're looking for as an alternative to uh, the state-directed investment from the PRC. The current budgetary treatment doesn't allow us to fully realize uh, the, the promise of the tool, and I believe what the intention of the BUILD Act was. Uh, we're looking for a way to fix that so that we can have more certainty and a larger amount of equity to deploy to fulfill our mission an equity fix would be very useful. Thank you. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman, but I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, on this issue that companies on the BIS entity list need to be included on Treasury's CMIC uh, sanctions list. And I yield. Yeah, and I agree with the gentleman, and I will be working very uh, diligently on that. And I also agree with the equity issue. We need to fully fund the equity. Otherwise, you cannot um, fulfill what Congress intended. So uh, with that, I uh, chair now recognizes Ms. Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, Assistant Secretary Clinton Brink, I want to start with you and zoom out a little bit. I think we spend a lot of time talking about strategic competition, and I think the administration has rightly identified the PRC as a challenge uh, and taken several actions engaged in strategic competition. But I, I would like to hear from you, what, what are we competing for? Um, and what is the administration's end goal with China so that we're not just talking about competition as an end in and of itself? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for, uh, for the, the, the broad strategic question. We're, we're uh, competing for and fighting for the kind of region that we want to live in. We talk about a, a free and open region where countries can freely pursue their, their interests and where people in those countries can uh, enjoy freedom. 
uh, we're talking about um, an interconnected region where we work closely with our allies, partners, and, and, and friends. We're talking about a prosperous region, right, where everyone benefits from free and unfettered trade. We're talking about a secure region uh, where we, uh, uh, disputes are resolved peacefully and, and we counter threats to security. And we're talking about a resilient region that has the capacity to uh, respond to transnational threats like climate change and um, uh, and the pandemic disease. We're fighting for, for freedom and democracy as well. That's what we stand for. It's an affirmative vision. Uh, that's where I start in my day every day. What are we doing every day to advance those uh, affirmative goals? As far as our end goal uh, with China, we've talked about the, the means that we use uh, in our competition, but uh, uh, we also uh, are interested in exploring cooperation where it's in our interest to do so. Uh, and at a minimum, whatever we do, we want to keep channels of communication open so that we don't have some kind of a miscalculation uh, that could veer into unintended conflict. Thank you. Um, and, and I just think it's really important that we stay focused on those end goals because China's not going anywhere and we don't want to feed into uh, the CCP's talking points around us just being out to weaken China for the sake of weakening them indefinitely um, and, and figuring out what kind of world we actually uh, want to try and get to. On the question of uh, keeping lines of communication open quickly, um, I know that you know Secretary Blinken told Wang Yi um, that we do want diplomatic engagement and open lines of communication, and he would be prepared to visit Beijing as soon as the conditions allow. Uh, when exactly will conditions allow for, for the visit to be rescheduled, and what conditions are you looking to? Congresswoman, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, the Secretary did make the decision following the irresponsible and unacceptable intrusion into our airspace of the Chinese high-altitude balloon that he simply could not travel to China at that time and be able to conduct any of the business across the broad-ranging agenda that he had uh, intended to. We did say that he would look to travel when conditions allow. We, we'll determine uh, what those conditions are uh, and, uh, and, and when. Thank you. Well, I think um, many of us on the committee would uh, encourage keeping those uh, lines of communication as, as open as possible, recognizing that it takes two uh, to, to be able to do that. Y yes, ma'am. I, I would say, unfortunately, sometimes our Chinese friends have used those channels of communication as a source of leverage, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, Assistant Administrator Schiffer, uh, I want to go to you. I, I know we've had a lot of talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and what China's been doing in that regard. I think we sometimes have a temptation to play whack-a-mole with our investments and just feel like we need to show up wherever China is showing up, uh, even if it's not uh, necessarily in our strategic interest. So I just wanted to hear how USAID is viewing this part of their work uh, and, and how you're thinking about prioritizing strategic investments where we have a comparative advantage instead of just this sort of trying to match one to one. Well, th thank you for that question. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, absolutely critical if we're going to be successful um, in uh, creating the sort of world uh, that, that, that we seek to create. Uh, as Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink uh, laid out, that we are disciplined and strategic uh, in our approach. Uh, and I would offer that, uh, that, that, that I think um, we, uh, we have been uh, as we look to work with countries that uh, are on the front line of uh, Beijing's coercive economic practices uh, and uh, countries and partners that are critical for, uh, for, for our own uh, security and for being able to build uh, the free and open uh, architecture that we seek, uh, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific or, uh, uh, or, around, or, or around the world. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge that, uh, that, that, that we have is that, well, Beijing's model for development assistance isn't actually about development assistance, it's about geostrategic advantage. Uh, our model is premised on being able to um, create bankable propositions that can attract capital uh, and that can have market, market access uh, for, for, for success, uh, and that is a, a, much, uh, a much trickier uh, proposition. Um, but we are seeking to, to fully align our work uh, with the strategic priorities of the administration, uh, including uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we're looking to uh, expand our presence there uh, significantly uh, over, the course of, uh, over the course of this year. 
Thank you, and I just know we're already seeing many countries where the, the Belt and Road Initiative has backfired uh, and where countries are starting to sour on Beijing as a result. So I, I appreciate your strategic approach, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair recognizes now the Chair of the Indo-Pacific uh, Subcommittee, Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Mix for holding today's hearing on generational challenge posed by PRC. I want to ask the first question to Ms. Estevez. Uh, when you came before the committee more than six months ago, you stressed your desire to harmonize the various U.S. government lists related to PRC companies. And I think most of us agree that's a common sense policy that needs to be implemented. So, for example, CRRC, a giant, well-known PLA supplier, is not on the commerce entity list, but is on the DOD military list, right? That seems like a glaring omission. So what specific steps have you taken to work with DOD to harmonize these lists? And when can we expect this process to be implemented? So a couple of things about the lists, and I understand the confusion over different lists. Different lists have different authorities around them. So the DOD list, which is required by uh, 1999 NDAA, I believe, uh, has no consequence for the companies that are listed, whereas the entity list, which requires uh, factual and articulable uh, information in order to put someone on the entity list, has consequences for the company. So I need data in order to put someone on the entity list. Uh, as opposed to research. I also have to really want to see if there's exports to that company, because otherwise it's a useless enterprise. Though we do put people on the entity list with very few exports. Uh, DOD, which, which sits on the committees that authorize licenses and put people on the entity list, can always propose someone to go on to the entity list, and then we'll take that up, and we'll look at the facts and the uh, data around that. So. From a standpoint of whether DOD can put someone on the list, the absolute answer is yes, through the process. So you're referring to legal risk associated with harmonizing DOD lists with the entity list. Let me tell you, our committee has consulted many lawyers and legal experts about this issue, but they have been told that BIS faces minimal legal risks. Uh, so, for instance, Congress express, expressly precludes BIS from the Administrative Procedures Act and sets a very low bar to clear for entity listings that an entity be or have the potential to be a threat to U.S. national security and foreign policy interests. So we have found only two recent cases in which PRC companies took BIS to court over an entity listing and BIS prevailed both times. So can you please explain the legal foundation for your assessment? Well, I, Representative Kim, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to give you the legal foundation that my lawyers happily articulate to me all the time when I'm saying, why can't we put this person on the list? Uh, because we do need to have fact-based. We are not the PRC. We don't make it up. We actually follow a process, and we live by the rule of law. It sounds like, to me, it's more like a political concern than a legal one. Zero but, political uh, concern. Yeah. Well, let me go on. How do you explain the, the declining rate of BIS entity listings? Because by our count, there were 114 in 2019. 147 in 2020, 85 in 2021, and 68 in 2022. But um, so can you explain that? Uh, I'd have to go back and to look at that. But I don't see us having a declining rate. I actually right. see us having an expedited rate on All right, I'll move on then. You know, I, I would like to ask a question to uh, Mr. Kreitenbrink. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you about the, the backlog of uh, $21 billion in arms sales to Taiwan. Last Congress, as you know, I introduced the Arms Export Delivery Solutions Act, and that requires DOS and DOD to report to Congress on reasons for backlog sales to Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific allies, and it uh, asked, you know, it provides the authority uh, that Congress could use to expedite these uh, deliveries. So, 
the legislation was already signed into law through NDAA, so can you provide me with an update on the implementation of that law and what steps that the State Department is taking to expedite that delivery of arms to Indo-Pacific partners and allies, especially our allies who are facing threats from the PRC and North Korea? Madam Chairman, thank you for your question on the specific question about a backlog in, in uh, arms sales to Taiwan. I can assure you that the U.S. government, certainly the State Department, uh, we are committed to meeting uh, our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act to assist Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense uh, capability. Uh, just uh, last year, we notified 13 different sales uh, to Taiwan, which uh, is the largest single number of notifications for Taiwan uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, I would say, uh, ma'am, there are production and delivery delays worldwide, not just for Taiwan, but for other partners. We're working expeditiously uh, to get through those. But I would also say sometimes I think that the, the notion that there is a long back leg, some of that uh, can also be misleading because when we notify the Congress the intent to have a sale, it does take some time for the companies to then negotiate those contracts and implement them. But I can assure you we're doing everything that we can. The Biden-Harris administration has notified more than $5 billion in foreign military sales to Taiwan, $37 billion since 2010 and $21 billion since 2019. We're committed uh, not just to arms sales to help Taiwan grow its deterrent capability, but also diplomatically with allies, partners, and friends to support the maintenance of peace and stability. Would you be able to tell us quick, quickly, percentage of those sales uh, that were signed off um, since President Biden has been in office? I, I'd have to do, do the math, but the figure as we stand today is $5 billion uh, thus far. Um, but I would also say, uh, beyond just comparing the numbers, it's important to look at the kinds of systems. And again, in consultation with our partners in Taiwan, we're focusing on building Taiwan's asymmetrical defense capabilities, which we, we think uh, we, we both think is most effective in maintaining a d deterrent capability so as to maintain peace and stability. Thank you. My time's up, so I'll yield back. Thank you. Chair recognizes Ms. Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for your service to our country. Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink, I have just returned from a congressional trip to Japan where we met with the Prime Minister and a host of lawmakers who talked extensively about their concerns about Chinese aggression and their decision to double their military spending, really an unprecedented decision, but also about their deep economic relationship with China. How can our relationship with Japan enhance our position with regard to China, and what additional steps can we be taking? Ma'am, thank you very much for your question. Uh, certainly no more important ally than, than Japan. And I think that uh, our alliance has never been stronger and our cooperation, both in a bilateral alliance sense, but increasingly globally, has really never been stronger. Japan is chair of the G7 this year. And uh, we're working uh, really diligently together with them under their leadership to make sure we take steps around the globe to promote peace and prosperity vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but also encountering uh, Chinese economic coercion uh, as well. Certainly from an alliance perspective, we very much welcome the historic steps that Japan has taken under Prime Minister Kishida. The uh, decision, as you noted, to increase their defense spending to 2% of uh, GDP. Their unprecedented national security strategy, which is almost completely aligned with the same vision that we've outlined and that other partners across Asia and Europe have outlined for their vision of the kind of world uh, that we want to live in. I think our alliance uh, collaboration and coordination is closer than ever before. We've collaborated as well in ways that the U.S. military will be adjusting its force posture in Japan, which also we believe will further contribute to regional stability. And increasingly, ma'am, maybe the thing I'm most excited about is that Japan has become our partner across the region and across the world, Southeast Asia, uh, certainly in the Pacific Islands and on the Ukraine war as well. Japan has played an absolutely leading role. We're very grateful for that. Again, I think our alliance is stronger than ever, and uh, we both benefited from it, from it greatly. Thank you. Under Secretary Estevez, can you share with us details about the recent deals the U.S. has reached with Japan and with the Netherlands on export controls that are important to our efforts to deal with China's aggressive behavior? Uh, what I can say, Congresswoman, is uh, first, Multilateral controls are critically important when we do these type of things. Uh, we are always in deep discussion with our allies around that. 
Uh, and further than that, I would have to say we need to talk in a closed hearing. Okay, thank you. So Assistant Secretary Crittenberg, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, one of the other things that we learned from our friends in Japan is that fewer Japanese students are coming to the U.S. to study, uh, as opposed to a large number of Chinese students who are now studying in the U.S. Uh, is this an issue of concern? And if so, how can we increase the number of Japanese students to strengthen that relationship uh, among different generations? And also, how can we harness the talent of the Chinese students who are studying here to help our country? Uh, yes, Congressman, thank you. Vitally important questions. I continue to believe that people-to-people -people ties are an absolute essential element uh, of many of our uh, partnerships uh, around the world. Certainly that's the case uh, with Japan, and I can speak from personal experience having been an exchange student as an undergrad in Japan for a year, which was uh, a really wonderful and life-altering experience. We have been concerned to see the, the decrease in the number of Japanese students studying in the United States. and. Uh, uh, my team, uh, together with colleagues uh, across uh, the State Department, across the interagency, and our fantastic embassy uh, in Tokyo are taking steps to further highlight the benefits of studying in the United States and the benefits of growing those people-to-people uh, -people ties, which remain obviously very deep between the United States uh, and Japan. But ma'am, I, I, I would say as well, um, you could say the same uh, for the importance, uh, continued importance of people-to-people -people ties between the United States and China. There are some 290,000 Chinese students in the United States uh, right now. Um, I think, uh, as one of the uh, one of the members of Congress made clear earlier, we should always distinguish uh, between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. And I'm confident that um, the uh, study that is carried out, the legitimate study carried out by Chinese students in the United States, benefits them, uh, benefits uh, the United States as well. And I know a large number of those very talented students end up staying in the United States and contribute to. Uh, our society and our economy here as well. And the final point, ma'am, that I'll make that a member made earlier as well, I hope that we're also uh, very careful as we, uh, as we focus on legitimate concerns uh, about uh, the Chinese Communist Party, as we focus on some of the concerns about how um, some of these uh, exchange programs uh, were uh, in some instances not used for legitimate purposes. We, we do have to make sure, again, we're distinguishing between uh, the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party, and we also have to make sure that none of our actions contribute to a disturbing rise in discrimination and hate directed at Asian Americans. Thank you. Thank, thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the chair of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, Ms. Salazar. That microphone? Yes, thank you, Chairman, for holding this very critical hearing. And uh, as we have spoken, the penetration of China in Latin America is real and terrifying. It has reached a level where our national security is in danger. Almost 30% of China global lending goes to Latin America. That is almost $140 billion. China has a physical presence in 25 out of the 31 Latin American countries and is the second largest user of the Panama Canal. But we know that the Chinese are not here for trade, they're here for war. And why do I say that? Because 10 years ago, China sold Hugo Chavez Venezuela VN1 tanks and advanced radar systems to Bolivia of the Evo Morales, is using right now Karakoram fighter jet planes, one of China's most advanced fighter jets. And now Argentina, that is very concerning is considering opening Chinese fighter jet factories. Uh, Chairman Xi Jinping has been to Latin America more times than Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden combined in the last 10 years. And I will explain to you what bothers me the most at this moment, and it scares, should scare all of us. Assistant Secretary, Mr. Quinton Brink, thank you for being here and for wanting to answer our questions. 10 years ago, now who is today Vice, Argentina's Vice President, Cristina Fernandez, who has been accused of um, corruption and who stole millions of dollars from the Argentinians, now she sold her soul to the Chinese by allowing them to have this, a deep space station the size of 400 football fields in the middle of the Patagonia Desert. 400 
football fields. I am sure the Chinese are very interested in studying the stars on every constellation, but from the Argentinian skies. But the problem is that Argentina has no idea what's going on there because the Chinese don't let them in. They do not let them in in Argentinian soil. So my question to you is, how dangerous is this station for our national security, sir? I'm asking you, Assistant Secretary. How uh, are you as concerned as we are, yes or no? I will say two things, ma'am. One, we are concerned with China's efforts around the world to increase uh, its its military presence, number one. And but I'm talking about steps. this number two, base uh, station in particular. I, I would have to consult uh, with my colleagues across the interagency and get back to you, and perhaps but it would you don't be know more anything about this? Perhaps it would be more appropriate in a, in a classified session. But I'm asking session. you, do you know about this deep space station in the Patagonia? I am not an expert you on are not. this situation. So you didn't know this happened? I'm not 400 an that you football raised. fields in the middle of Patagonia. I mean, isn't that concerning? Does this have anything to do with the Chinese balloon that was flying over our territory? Again, I'll say, ma'am, that we are uh, aware of a number of steps that China has taken uh, around the world. To I'm talking about Latin presence. America, and I'm talking about Un this. Understood. You don't. You don't know about this. Interesting. Okay. So who does? Ma'am, as I said, I'd be delighted to consult with my colleagues in the interagency and get back to you, and perhaps it would be most appropriate to do so uh, in a classified session, but I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so interesting. Right, so now let me ask you something else. Do you also know that Christina Fernandez, the actual vice president, wants to buy 18 Chinese JF-17 fighter jets? They want to buy them from the Chinese. Are you aware of that? And then not only that, to build a fighter jet factory in Buenos Aires and sell, and sell those fighter jets to other neighbors, meaning Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, Bolivia. Are you aware of that? Uh, Ma'am, uh, again, I'm not an expert on either of those questions. And I'd be happy to take that back and come back to you. OK. So we certainly hope that either you or one of your colleagues can come back to this forum and explain to us. Look the, forward to that. I Thank would you. imagine that it's, it's pretty um, um, concerning. Uh, so since we cannot get any answers from you, then I was going to use this forum to send the message to the Argentinians, specifically to the vice president, and I'm going to do it in Spanish. Because maybe they are not hearing from you, but maybe they'll hear it from me. And I'm going to warn, forewarn them that if they decide to build a fighter jet factory of Chinese uh, fighter jets, it's, it's a very bad idea for them. And moving forward and everything that has to do with the relationship with the United States. So that's why I'm going to say it in Spanish, if, and I, I uh, beg your pardon if you do not understand. Lo voy a decir en español para que quede muy bien claro a mis amigos argentinos. Su presidenta y su presidente está haciendo un pacto con el diablo que puede tener consecuencias de proporciones bíblicas. Los Estados Unidos no se va a quedar con los brazos cruzados porque no se puede tener un aliado que fabrique y exporte aviones militares chinos y que se los venda a los vecinos. Hay dos mundos, el mundo libre y el mundo de los esclavos. Espero que los argentinos se queden en el mundo libre. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Salazar. And I will be uh, requesting a classified briefing on this very issue. Thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Dean. Well, it's Madeline. I'm sorry, Madam Dean. What am I saying? Excuse me. <laughs> Thank Apologies. You, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, uh, to all of our witnesses for testifying. I hope you know that some of our absences in this room is, reflects not at all on the subject matter and your work, but I'm in a markup in another committee at the same time. So with the limited time that I have, uh, I'd like to examine and understand China's role in illicit fentanyl and what the United States is doing about it. We all know that fentanyl is wreaking havoc on our nation, on our communities. In the year ending 20, uh, September of 22, CDC estimates that synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl, were responsible for about 73,000 overdose deaths, 70% of all drug overdose deaths, which topped 108,000 in a single year. Those numbers are staggering. 
That's 300 people a day dying of overdose. Some of you may know this is an issue personal for me. I have a son in recovery, long-term recovery from opioid addiction, now for over a decade. By the grace of God, he's in that space. But we know too many of our children and, uh, and adults uh, are not, and we are losing them. China was the primary source of illegal fentanyl entering the United States until the PRC imposed controls in 2019. Today, Mexican drug cartels rely on PRC-sourced precursor chemicals to produce fentanyl. While cooperation between the United States and PRC has yielded some success in curbing illegal fentanyl, recent tensions have hindered that progress. Under Secretary uh, Estevez, Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink, how is the Biden administration working to pressure the PRC to impose further controls on fentanyl precursors? And what is the administration doing? What progress is being made to pressure the PRC to combat financial flows from illicit fentanyl? Uh, Mr. Estevez, either one, yes. Ma'am, thank you very much for your question. And certainly we recognize uh, the tragedy and the travesty caused by uh, these, these opioids, um, uh, synthetic uh, opioids and certainly fentanyl. I, I think you've described it very well, ma'am. Uh, China did take steps in 2019 to control fentanyl, which brought direct shipments of fentanyl down to almost zero. Now the problem, ma'am, has transformed into precursor chemicals that are coming out of China are being diverted uh, elsewhere and then manufactured into fentanyl and synthetic opiates and brought into the United States. Uh, I would say we've done two things. One, uh, in our engagement, direct engagement with the PRC, we have made cracking down on this precursor fentanyl problem one of our absolute highest priorities. We've, we've told the Chinese they need to take a number of steps to make sure that they, they and their entities know to whom they are selling uh, these precursors to, uh, to try to prevent their diversion, to make sure that uh, they're properly labeled uh, and the like. And I will say, candidly speaking, ma'am, um, uh, our conversations have not been very satisfactory uh, on that for uh, a variety of issues, partly related to the broader bilateral relationship, partly related to some of the concerns that the Chinese have, which we think uh, are unfounded. But I can assure you uh, this is an absolute top priority in our engagement with China. The second major thing that we're trying to do is work with other countries in the world to together put pressure on China to take the right steps. We're not the only country that suffers uh, from the scourge. Certainly uh, in North America, others do, but this has increasingly been uh, becoming a, a global problem. Thank you. And, and if I could. Yes, please. Uh, unfortunately, there's no exports going to the fentanyl or precursor manufacturer in China. However, we're working with DEA right now to assess whether we can put restrictions on machinery or, or lab equipment that they use for that. So we're doing that kind of assessment, working both my enforcement and my uh, export administration side to see what we can do to crack down on that. And if I could follow up, um, uh, Mr. Crittenbrink, you said the direct engagement is not going very well. So what do we do in the face of that? Uh, I'd say two things. One, uh, we haven't given up. Uh, in our direct engagement with the Chinese and using all tools and all leverage at our disposal uh, to try to make progress directly with the Chinese. But I think, as, as I hope I've made clear here today, I think equally as important in our diplomacy writ large with China and on the fentanyl issue as well is to work together uh, with our partners and friends who are also suffering from the diversion of these precursor chemicals and together uh, to engage the Chinese and put pressure on the Chinese to do the right thing, to control these chemicals in a way that prevents their diversion uh, and illegal manufacture into fentanyl. Well, I hope you'll call upon me and call upon all of us to be partners with you uh, in making sure that we do everything possible, and we have to think outside the box, everything possible to reduce the trafficking of fent the manufacture of fentanyl, the trafficking of fentanyl, we now know that it is being laced into almost anything. And you don't have to be an addict to die of this. Uh, we heard testimony from a father whose 15-year-old uh, son, Noah, uh, recently uh, died of uh, fentanyl poisoning, thought he had purchased a uh, Percocet pill. So you don't have to be an addict. It's not one thing or another. This is extraordinarily deadly. Uh, in our communities. So anything we can do to partner with you, Congress can partner with you. Please call upon us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Dean. And I look forward to working with you and the ranking member 
on this very important issue. This is obviously a very bipartisan issue, and I, uh, uh, we'd like to get something done. And uh, it touches uh, thousands of lives. And I think uh, 100,000 young people have died just this last year. So thank you for bringing that up. Chair now recognizes Ms. Radawagan. Talofa, good morning. Thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks. And thank you all for testifying today. Secretary Estevez, my questions are for you. Why is it appropriate for BIS to let U.S. technologies be exported to SMIC to advance the CCP's military modernization efforts? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, SMIC is on the entity list. It's on the entity list with a not a, a complete stop. It's we prevent the most advanced capabilities for making semiconductors from going to SMIC. So they can't make semiconductors below 14 nanometers. Uh, Thank you. Following up on that, does BIS think it has visibility into where the chips produced by a CCP military company are going? Uh, most chips actually uh, made in China or consumed in China. However, we, do, uh, we are watching to see if they are moving chips to Russia in violation of our sanctions. Is increased dependency on the PRC for these types of chips a national security issue? And how many PRC chips are you comfortable in having in DOD systems and U.S. critical infrastructure? Uh, so, you know, my export controls do part of the the job here. The other part of the job is what we call in commerce, you know, on play defense, we play, the other part plays offense. I want to thank Congressman McCall for his support of the CHIPS Act uh, being rolled out uh, as, as we speak. Uh, developing capability in the United States for the most advanced chips is critical. And for me personally, no chip in a DOD system should come from anywhere else but the United States. If these are risks, why is BIS failing to act and mitigate this threat when it can easily use existing authorities? Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I believe that we are uh, stopping the most advanced chips from being made in China. Chips are a ubiquitous commodity at the legacy level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Crow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, all of you, for your testimony today. My first question is about Afghanistan and uh, China's efforts to capitalize on some of the, uh, the mining opportunities there. In 2008, uh, under the Karzai administration, uh, the, the, the um, Afghans signed a 30-year contract with a Chinese joint venture company to extract high-grade copper from uh, Mess Inok. Uh, can uh, one of you give me an update on Chinese involvement uh, with regard to that contract and their um, uh, operations to try to get copper out of Afghanistan? Representative Crow, uh, thank you for your question. I would have to take that back and, and get back to you. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the details of that deal. I know of it in general terms, but not in any detailed way. But thank I'd be you. happy to bring that back. Yeah, that'd be great for the record. Thank you. The, then the second is a broader question about um, Chinese infrastructure generally. I mean, we, we, I think, sometimes view the Chinese as 10 feet tall. Uh, but they obviously have problems uh, uh, upon problems of their own, uh, one of which is a pretty substantial blowback in certain areas on One Belt, One Road initiative efforts. I've spoken with a number of ambassadors and heads of state in Africa, and they have relayed to me that uh, not only the predatory uh, economics and high debt financing terms of a lot of these investments, but the infrastructure itself is not great and it is failing. Plus, a lot of it's built with Chinese labor, which is causing domestic turmoil within a lot of African countries as they see Chinese workers come in to build projects while their unemployment rate uh, remains very, very high. Can you talk to me about uh, some of the blowback that you're seeing with regard to their practices, particularly in, in Africa? That first, why don't I take an initial stab, uh, Congressman? I, I think you've outlined the problem well. We hear the same complaints from partners around the world. And what we have done is, one, 
to caution countries to be well aware of what they're getting into when they sign into one of these deals, whether it's the predatory finance that you mentioned, the fact that uh, uh, the, the quality of the infrastructure can be in question, uh, and then through the use of PRC labor, oftentimes the economic benefits don't redound to that country, not to mention whether the, product will be, uh, the project will be sustainable, uh, uh, in, in, uh, including in environmental terms. But the other thing we try to do is offer alternatives, and I wonder if my colleagues would like to speak to that. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I completely agree with uh, what you said, Congressman. I mean, it, the, our experience is that not only do uh, projects by the PRC not often uh, accrue to the economic benefit of the countries, then they do burden countries with debt, but they also frequently involve in, uh, environmental hazards, labor violations, uh, poor quality, uh, inappropriateness for local laws and conditions. Uh, this is why we've experienced uh, strong demand for our product. Uh, countries are looking for choice, and particularly uh, the choice that we and our allies offer, which is high standard, uh, which respects uh, local laws and conditions, which is transparent, which is uh, funding at the private level. Um, this is the value proposition that the Development Finance Corporation uh, is is presenting around the world. And, and with regard to the Development Finance Corporation, which I think is a, a phenomenal program, uh, what um, barriers are, are you seeing in really scaling that and expediting it? Uh, and what would you need from Congress to, frankly, double down on that effort? Thanks for that question. You know, uh, the DFC is just over three years old, and uh, I think we've made extraordinary progress in, in that time. Uh, but the Build Act contemplated uh, a new tool set for uh, DFC, uh, importantly one that includes the ability to make equity investments. Uh, equity investments would allow us uh, to take more risk, to be uh, forward leaning on the type of opportunities that we pursue uh, in infrastructure and other companies uh, around the world. Uh, we've made progress, uh, but we have a limitation from a budgetary uh, treatment of equity. Uh, limitation in our ability to realize the full promise of the equity tool. Uh, we look forward to working with this committee uh, and others to uh, remove those barriers and realize the full potential that the Build Act contemplated uh, for DFC. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to finish by uh, on this topic of, of China having their own problems and just being very clear uh, to, to China and to everyone listening that um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Ukraine emboldening China and strengthening uh, China and uh, weakening the West given the, the attrition and the amount of weapons and equipment we're pouring into Ukraine. I actually think it's the opposite. I think United States, uh, NATO, and the West are uh, greatly uh, formalizing and increasing the intelligence sharing and our analysis. We're strengthening our defense industrial base by essentially doing a real-time audit of some of our, our weaknesses and, and shortfalls, uh, but we're fixing it and moving fast to fix it. Uh, we are uh, increasing our partner training. We're learning about weapon systems and how ours perform vis-a-vis -vis, uh, old Soviet systems. We're strengthening NATO and increasing investments and modernizing the NATO alliance. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, a, 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 an opportunity for us to show the strength of the West uh, in how uh, China is on the wrong side of history. Uh, thank you. I yield back, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now and recognizes Mr. Heisinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is uh, for those of you uh, that uh, we're questioning today. This is my first term and first time uh, being here at the Foreign Affairs Committee. I sit on the Financial Services Committee. And the reason why I mention that is because in my uh, one of my past uh, jobs was chairing what at the time was called the Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee, where I had the opportunity to look at our review process here in the United States when it came to uh, sensitive technology. And I'm going to briefly touch on on something uh, here regarding uh, a battery company, uh, A123, that we reviewed at the time. But you know, obviously. Uh, Obviously, COVID exposed a real issue with our supply chains and our dependence, whether it's chips, but certainly batteries and coming from Michigan. Um, I don't have any of the direct manufacturers, but I have all the suppliers, uh, all the tier one, tier two, tier three automotive suppliers that are in my, com uh, in my district, both past district and current district, including battery uh, companies. Um, 
but the, uh, the, the, the A123 battery deal at the time was somewhat controversial. And I know I was in on some uh, classified briefings on that, uh, and uh, yet that was seemingly went through the process pretty quickly, and I felt like I was arguing against our own government, frankly, uh, at times about why this would be a system, uh, would, would be, could be problematic. And I, I'm curious, uh, Under Secretary Estevez, do you mind, just very quickly, is dependence on China for batteries a national security issue? Uh, First of all, I want to note that the one, two, three deal went through CFIUS. Yes, yep. I'm aware. Yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> I am aware. Uh, probably not the best decision that CFIUS made, but that's fine. Uh, well, we we're, we're finding consensus uh, there then. Yeah, I, look, there's a whole bunch of technologies that we need to start doing investment on in the United States. We should not be reliant on China for batteries, for chips, for uh, pharmaceutical precursors, for rare earths. And we need to, you know, and my colleagues uh, to my to my left uh, are are more in the engagement with uh, allies to, yeah. to build up those capabilities. I'm in the stopping from the Chinese to get stuff. Yeah. But we certainly need to look at our supply chains better. Sure. And we had a review of the CFIUS process, and Representative Barr, who's also on this committee, uh, who followed me as the chair of uh, MPT, uh, was was a crucial part of that. Um, I did do want to move on here in my last two minutes uh, uh, for Mr. Uh, uh, Crittenbrink. Um, has the State Department refused to approve or requested the delay of sanctions to hold the PRC accountable for human rights violations uh, against the Uyghurs? Congressman, what I would say is, um, as I indicated earlier, human rights remain central to our foreign policy. I understand policy. that, We've taken but a have, range has of there steps. been a request for a delay? We've taken a range of steps uh, to impose costs on those who are carrying out genocide in Xinjiang, including uh, sanctioning uh, under Global Magnitsky 12 officials and another okay. seven uh, uh, under uh, uh, who have been uh, placed under visa right. restrictions. I, I've got a minute and a half here. Let's let's get very specific. Has Deputy Secretary Sherman refused to approve or requested any delay in implementation of congressionally mandated the Uyghur Human Rights Policy uh, or, or IRPA sanctions? What, what I would say, sir, is we continue to take a number of steps, and we will take a number of steps uh, to hold accountable those that is, in China. That, that's a are, yes or no kind of question, though. Congressman, I, I, will, I will just reiterate what I've said. We are committed to Well, either you steps. know or you don't know. Congressman, we're, we're committed to taking steps. I'm, I'm happy to take that back and, and, and come back to you. Uh, please do. Yeah, that, that is the purpose of this. And, and have you personally supported the de any delay in IRPA? I support making sure that we take steps uh, to ensure that we hold to account uh, those in China who that, are carrying out. I understand that, but respectfully, that's not my question, both uh, for Mr. Sherman or, or for yourself. Have you felt it was in the best interest for a delay? I think it's in America's national interest to continue to carry out our steps to hold account those people. And are, are you doing everything out. that you can do to push forward on those steps and implementing those steps has been congressionally mandated in a bipartisan banner, I might add? Yes, sir. I'm confident that all of my colleagues and all of my leadership are committed to making sure that we hold to account those in China. And moving ahead in a timely care. fashion. Yes, sir. Okay. We're going to hold we, you to that. We are committed, again, to holding to account those who are carrying out genocide in Xinjiang in China. Okay, we expect that uh, action to continue. And with that, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Recognizes Mr. Stanton. Mr. Stanton is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important uh, hearing. This is my first hearing as a member of this committee, and I'm honored to, uh, to be here. Uh, last year, Republicans and Democrats came together to pit pass the Chips and Science Act, a historic investment in American ingenuity and advanced technology. Few states stand to benefit more than my home state of Arizona as we welcome $40 billion in investment from TSMC in North Phoenix, expand Intel's footprint in my district in the East Valley, and support innovation from dozens of other companies. That's why I'm gravely concerned about the theft of American intellectual property by the PRC. Last fall, FBI Director Ray warned that not only does Chinese IP theft threaten these companies' bottom lines, but it jeopardizes our economic competitiveness and our national security. Mr. Estevez, 
Uh, last October, the Biden administration imposed uh, controls designed to limit the development and production in China of advanced node semiconductor, semiconductor production equipment, advanced computing items, and supercomputers. That was a very important step. What, what other steps is the Department of Commerce taking to combat, combat IP theft, particularly for semiconductor technology? So, so uh, let me start off by saying thank you for the notice on chips, uh, very important. Uh, we put those uh, sanctions on uh, export controls on semiconductor equipment and related technologies, you know, for national security reasons, not necessarily for IP theft. However, when we find companies that are provable that they have stolen IP, we will take action against those companies. We'll stop. What additional tools do you need from Congress to better protect American enterprise from IP theft? Uh, from, from the export control perspective, uh, I think I have the authorities that I need. Uh, from a greater perspective of cyber theft, uh, you know, the companies need to invest in their cyber protection, and they need to notify when such breaches happen. Thank you. Um, I want to piggyback on questions from my colleague, uh, Madeline Dean, earlier. Uh, more than five Arizonans die every day from opioid overdoses, nearly half of which involve fentanyl. Unfortunately, the PRC continues to play a deadly role by allowing export of precursor chemicals, the core ingredients that some bad actors, like the Mexican drug cartels, can use to make uh, fentanyl. PRC seems to have backed off cooperating with the United States on stopping the flow of fentanyl substances. They attribute that to U.S. Entity, entity listings and export controls, including on institutions implicated in human rights violations. Mr. Estevez, question for you as well. Uh, what's your analysis? What's really going on here? Has the PRC stopped cooperating out of retaliation, uh, or have some of our controls truly complicated their ability to cooperate? Um, that's really a better question for my state colleague, uh, but we can't, from a national security perspective, it's important that we exercise our authorities with export controls. Mr. Kribring, please. Congressman, thank you very much for your question again. This is a, a, a vital national security issue, important to the lives and the health and safety of American citizens. We've made it one of our absolute top priorities in engaging with the Chinese. Unfortunately, uh, um, they have uh, put up various roadblocks to cooperation lately. They have complained about regulatory steps that we have taken that uh, allegedly impede that cooperation. We do not agree with that view, and we do not believe that there are any steps that the United States has taken from a regulatory perspective that ought to impede cooperation. We believe that China has a responsibility uh, to take steps to impede the flow of these precursor chemicals. As I indicated earlier, in 2019, they did take steps to schedule fentanyl, which stopped the shipment of fentanyl to almost zero. Now the problem is these precursor chemicals who are diverted in, uh, which are diverted and, and then illegally manufactured uh, into fentanyl. We've made clear in our bilateral engagement that China needs to do better and it needs to take steps to make sure that their companies know to whom they're selling that these chemicals are, are appropriately labeled and the like. And then, Congressman, I would hasten to add, we're also working with other international partners to put pressure on the Chinese uh, to do the same. Okay, I have time for one other quick question on export control. Obviously, we're, we've shown real leadership on that issue, the Biden administration, but obviously we need our partners around the world to do the same thing. We can't act in a unilateral way. What steps, what other countries are we engaging with to impose multilateral export controls? And that's for any of our witnesses. Yeah. So for any control we put on, we generally engage uh, multilaterally, unless we, the United States, are the only company that, or country that makes a uh, piece of equipment. Uh, I can't talk in specifics around the semiconductor export controls, but we have engaged multilaterally on that, and I'd be happy to talk in a um, classified setting about what we've done there. And on, you know, just look what we've done on Russia, 38 nations put on like controls to what we put on. That eventually will stifle the Russian industrial base so they cannot reconstitute their military. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Mr. Davidson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, despite the World Trade Organization membership China enjoys, China is neither a market economy nor a developing nation. 
As a condition of membership, China committed to be a market economy. They are also uh, allowed to pretend that they are still a developing economy. Claiming this special status allows the People's Republic of China to exploit developing na developed nations like ours uh, through various perks, such as restricting imports to protect certain industries and complying with fewer WTO obligations. The failure of our country and others to enforce the obligations of World Trade Organization membership on China have been disastrous for America's economy, our manufacturing sector in particular, and our middle class. The consequences are especially harmful in my home state of Ohio. Are any of you aware that the Chinese Communist Party military intelligence units have conducted cyber attacks on U.S. businesses, resulting in intellectual property theft of dual-use technology? Congressman, thank you for your question. The, the, the cyber threat posed by China uh, is uh, vast, highly significant. We're taking a number uh, of steps to, to counter it, but certainly the cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property rights and trade secrets uh, remains uh, a top concern. Our um, whole of government uses of intelligence units uh, to steal intellectual properties, characteristics of market economies? Congressman, I would say that it is unacceptable for any country, regardless of status, to use cyber-enabled means to steal uh, intellectual property and trade secrets. Well, I agree with your statement there, and thank you for that. Is China unique in its use as a World Trade Organization member of its intelligence units to steal intellectual property of American companies on behalf of the companies that they're trying to benefit inside China? I can speak with confidence to the challenge posed by China. I'd have to take back your question as to whether there are others uh, that pose a similar threat. Thank you, and uh, that's concerning. But, uh, you know, Mr. Estevez, in 2020, uh, BIS published uh, a report which revealed some uh, concerning information regarding AK Steel, which is now owned by Cleveland Cliffs. Uh, if it stated, uh, quote, if AK Steel's grain-oriented electrical steel goes, operation were to close, the United States would lack the ability to produce transformers of any power handling capacity without relying on foreign sources. Does this assessment sound accurate? Uh, I would have to go back and look at that, but I'd be happy to, to get a, a detailed discussion on goes with you if you prefer. Yeah, so, it, you know, your organization publishes a lot of these reports, so I wouldn't expect you know all of them, but this is work that BIS did do, and it highlights how important it is to understand the particular sectors that are vulnerable. In China, when they use these powers uh, and exploit their membership status in WTO, they're shaping market access and they're targeting specific companies and specific intellectual property. Uh, this grain-oriented steel produced by AK Steel or Cleveland Cliffs now is the only U.S. source for this. And as we look at the sensitivity of our electrical grid and vulnerabilities there, um, this is just one of the, you know, core issues. Um, and as I, as I have just a little bit of time, uh, Mr. Crittenbrink, I, I just want to highlight with, uh, with the abuses in fentanyl and tools there, would it help uh, if we designated cartels in particular, which are moving this product, as uh, enemies of our country and made uh, people that support those cartels by supplying precursor chemicals, for example, or moving money and cash back and forth? Uh, eligible for sanctions and intelligence collection? Would that be helpful? Well, Congressman, I think as a matter of general principle, we'd be supportive of looking at any step we can to get at this scourge. Um, but I would need to take uh, your question back to the experts, both in our department, across the interagency, and come back uh, to you with a more uh, formal answer. Thank you. I, I hope to do just that, because uh, it highlights the important relationship between the Financial Services Committee, which I also serve on, in this committee because you know, when you, we look at uh, the sanctions regime in OFAC, it's an important tool, uh, the financial intelligence that we look at. Uh, the cartels are in this business for money, and I think uh, we have to get at all of the corrupt influence the People's Republic of China is doing, and the Chinese Communist Party doesn't allow these things to go on unchecked. Uh, we have to believe they have the power to change course, and I hope that we'll use all the tools in the kit bag 
to, to check the abusive uh, influence of the Chinese Communist Party and the negative impact on our country, our economy, and our culture. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davidson. You raise a great point. Um, why is China still under a developing nation designation, which entitles them to interest-free loans by the World Bank or very low interest rate loans, and then allows them then to use that for their Belt and Road Initiative with usurious interest rates? Um, and then they rape the rare earth minerals, they bring in their own workers, take over a port or base, and then when they uh, fail, then they, the uh, IMF goes in to bail them out. I, I think they're extraordinary, and they're very, I give them an A plus for being very clever at the way they can manipulate global institutions and take advantage of them. I'm sure all of you agree with that, but I, I won't ask you for a comment on that. But I, I thank the gentleman for raising the point. I think we should be taking a hard look at that. The chair recognizes Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has forced Central Asian uh, countries to reassess their relationship with Moscow. So I'm curious, Mr. Crittenbrink, um, based on your assessment, uh, how has China's approach uh, to the region changed, and how receptive uh, are the member countries in, in Central Asia uh, to their overtures. Thank you, Congressman, for your question. I, I would note Central Asia is outside of my uh, area of responsibility, so I will quickly outstrip the uh, the level of my expertise. But uh, I, I would say certainly China has um, stepped up uh, its engagement uh, in the region, but uh, so has the United States. And I think you can see that through, uh, including through our, our senior level travel. But I would have to take back uh, any, any detailed questions on, on Central Asia. Can you speak about, you just mentioned our approach, though. How has our approach changed? I think it would be safer if I take that back to my, okay. my, uh, my assistant secretary colleague to answer in an expert okay. way. Uh, let me ask also about Iran. I know President Raisi visited uh, President Xi in China recently. Uh, your assessment of that visit? Well, uh, I can again speak in general terms, and beyond that, I'd have to, to take your question back. We are concerned about the deepening ties between Iran and the PRC, make no mistake about it. Uh, and it concerns us uh, in a number of ways, both uh, the oil purchases uh, for sure, but also uh, other concerning uh, areas of cooperation that I think pose uh, a national security threat to the United States and the international community. Okay, uh, l let me turn to Mr. Schiffer and Mr. Nathan, if, if I might. Uh, how successful has China been in the Middle East and Central Asia with their Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, if you can speak to either, starting with you, Mr. Nathan. It's hard for me to say how successful it is. They've definitely spent a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that's the overall issue with the Belt and Road Initiative, is that uh, they've exerted influence, spent money, burdened countries with debt. Uh, left projects behind that are poor quality, often inappropriate, and then use that as a way to extract other concessions. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we make investments, it's based on uh, our values, our standards, private sector, and we're not uh, attaching strings to them in the so, same way. So let me, let me ask, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mr. Nathan, yeah. because we quantify their influence by dollar amounts. Right. Uh, is it fair to say in some cases it actually might be backfiring uh, as they layer on burdens, responsibilities, commitments that can't be fulfilled on, on countries that have been beneficiaries? Are there any examples of that that you might share? Well, I, I, I don't have at my fingertips any examples, but I think it's absolutely the case that it backfires. When, when I travel and talk to uh, leaders, they're very interested in our projects, in our funding, uh, that comes with high standards, it's free from the kind of integrity uh, and corruption problems, uh, environmental labor standards um, that BRI projects often uh, entail. And Mr. Schiffer? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a very, very uh, important set of questions that, that, that you're asking. Um, and I can certainly offer one example uh, in our uh, wheelhouse. Uh, you know, we have, we have had the opportunity to engage uh, with the Kyrgyz Republic uh, over the past year uh, because they have become increasingly concerned about the amount of debt uh, that they owe to China's XM Bank. And so they uh, have worked with us um, to um, support efforts to provide better analysis uh, of their debt burden uh, and to um, build better uh, capital controls uh, into their system to manage that debt relationship uh, with the PRC going forward. 
Uh, so we do see opportunities like that okay. uh, in Central Asia where we are looking to uh, find opportunities for AID, our colleagues at DFC and across the interagency um, to be able to play smarter and better uh, in that region. So on that subject, Mr. Schiffer, I, you know, I'm getting personally a little bit tired and concerned of us completely uh, spending most of our time uh, pointing out how we are failing in our competition with China. How can we do better vis-a-vis -vis your perspectives, especially you, Mr. Nathan and Mr. Schiffer, uh, in competing with them? Uh, what can our Congress do to support your efforts? Um, well, look, we, we, we certainly welcome uh, any opportunity to work with, uh, work with Congress um, to be able to shine more of a light uh, on the efforts that we're undertaking, whether it's in Central Asia, um, across the Indo-Pacific, or, or, or around the world. Um, that, that demonstrates the, uh, the value proposition that, that we bring to the game uh, and the, the importance of American leadership. Mm -hmm. We just have a few seconds left, but Mr. Nathan. Yeah, and I say w one of the uh, missions that we were given by the Build Act explicitly, explicitly was to offer an alternative to authoritarian government, uh, state-controlled uh, investments in the developing world. Part of the commitment of the Build Act to give us uh, that um, that tool was the equity investment authority that we were given and um, finding a budgetary treatment that allows that tool to fully realize its potential I think would be critical. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you all for your time today. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, Mr. Nathan, I understand that you have a hard stop at 1250 uh, and clearly we are now exceeding that. So I'd request that if members have questions for you that you would be able to respond in writing if that's okay. That's absolutely okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, I will recognize uh, Mr. Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you um, for your testimony here today. Um, and Mr. Lee, when you, you can leave while I speak. You don't, don't worry about that. I'll be directing some of my conversations uh, to your right. Thank you. Um, Assistant uh, Secretary uh, Clinton Brink. Um, my district in New Jersey, 7th Congressional District, you know, just like many districts around the country, has been impacted um, by fentanyl. We see time and time again um, intercepts in human tra and that is impacting all of, of uh, all Americans. Um, in a January 30th, 2023, State Department press release announcing sanctions against U.S. Um, fentanyl traffickers. The U department omitted any mention of fentanyl of to China or that the designee's relationship to OFAC uh, designate Chinese chemical transportation company uh, Shanghai um, Fast Fine Chemicals, stark contrast from Treasury's press release. Why is that? I'm sorry, Congressman. I do want to make sure I understand your question that um, there was a sanctions announcement on January 30 that did not include Chinese yes. entities, is that yes. right, sir? Yes, from, from, or as Treasury's press release did, and the Department uh, and your State Department did not. Why is that? Um, Congressman, I, I'll have to take that back. I, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, the, the precise answer to that question is, but I'm happy to take that back and come back to you. And I will, as I mentioned earlier, certainly stopping the flow of fentanyl precursors from China is an absolute top priority, uh, and happy to talk about what we're doing all on that. But I'll have to take your specific question back, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, also, um, also to you, um, can you talk? I know the Chairman McCall obviously mentioned uh, the impact on uh, in, in Ukraine and, and China and, uh, and the Russia uh, partnership therein. Um, can you speak to how China is helping Russia evade sanctions that have been put in place due to Putin's invasion of Ukraine? Well. Congressman, this is what I can say. We've made very clear, including most recently when Secretary Blinken was in Munich and met with Director Wang Yi, what the, uh, the implications and consequences could be for China if it engaged uh, in providing material assistance to the Russian military in Ukraine or assisted China or assisted Russia in uh, systematic sanctions evasion. I think what I could say, sir, is we do have a concern for some of the steps that China has taken to support Russia's war in Ukraine. It's, it's, uh, it's spreading of disinformation uh, about the cause of the war and about Russian activities there. It's shielding of Russia in the UN and, and, and other areas, some of its economic activities. Um, 
We have sanctioned certain uh, uh, Chinese entities who, who have provided assistance to uh, Russia. Uh, perhaps my colleague would want to respond uh, to that in more detail. Uh, that's correct, Congressman. First of all, I want to recognize that my sister lives in your district. Okay. In Bentham. Uh, we have put 12. Great community. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, we've put 12 Chinese entities on the entity list, meaning uh, they can't get exports from the United States uh, on their licensing regime that we put on because they were backfilling Russia, providing uh, dual-use yeah. technology to Russia. We also put one Chinese entity on the entity list for providing parts that go into Iranian drones. Mm -hmm. So we constantly work this with our colleagues at State Defense and uh, Energy and with the uh, intelligence community to assess trade flows and identify companies that may be violating our sanctions, and if they are, we'll take care of them. Um, and, and sanctions are obviously part of these conversations. Um, why have they potentially not been enacted sooner? Uh, for an entity listing, we need uh, specific data about a, a specific uh, entity, so specific and articulable facts that when we see something going on, that we can legally put them on the list. Okay. Thank you. You have back my time. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'll uh, go ahead and recognize Mr. Allred. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for uh, being here. I know it's probably been a long day. Uh, you know, I hope we can have a bipartisan response uh, to our concern with uh, you know, Beijing's actions. Uh, but I want to be clear. We have so many strengths that the CCP could only dream of bringing to the table. Uh, and as I've had a chance to see firsthand on my travels uh, as a member of this committee around the world, from Africa to the Indo-Pacific with our allies there to even former Soviet states in Central Asia, uh, everyone uh, would prefer to trade with us, uh, to attract our investment, and even uh, to have us as their preferred security partner. And we need to keep in mind uh, that as this president has made a central focus of his foreign policy, that we're in a global competition, but that we should be confident in our abilities. And I sometimes worry that some of the discussions here make us sound like, like we're afraid. Uh, and I think we have nothing to be afraid of. We, in fact, as I said, I think we have real strengths. But I am concerned in particular uh, with the Chinese um, expansion of their influences uh, in the global south. And wanted to, if I can find the question, uh, ask about our USAID uh, process and, and timelines. Just give me one sec. This is the problem when you have too many questions and you know, you go to this stage of the hearing. <laughs> So, uh, how do our USAID project timeline, so five-year projects, uh, one-year budget planning compared to the types of investments and projects that are funded by the PRC, and, and how do those timelines, if they do or at all, uh, inhibit longer-term uh, consistent U.S. engagement in, in partnerships around the world, particularly uh, in the Global South? Uh, you know, it, it, in some significant respects, uh it does place us at a disadvantage in the sense that uh, our uh, our friends in, in, in Beijing uh, can, as you pointed out, operate with a, uh, a long timeline and without the sort of economic uh, and market logic uh, that uh, constrain uh, constrain our activities. Um, and, and the reality of the uh, congressional authorization and appropriation cycle and <laughs> How we work uh, wor work through that system to be able to uh, to, to obligate uh, for for projects um, can uh, can create a certain tension uh, in in the process. If I well, this is that way. this is your opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to let us know how Congress can provide USAID with additional tools or resources or authorities to allow you to better compete because I think it's an important component of our competition. We talk a lot about our. Uh, defense deterrence. We're going to talk a lot about you know, our controls, uh, but this is one of our most important tools. And I, everywhere I go, especially in the global south, I hear that we're not doing enough. Uh, I mean, at the liberty of suggesting uh, that you have a, uh, a conversation with your friends on the appropriations committee, <laughs> if it were possible to have multi-year appropriations, that would go a very, very long way towards uh, allowing us to do the sort of longer-term planning 
uh, that, that would allow us to be more competitive. Well, I just want to say you know, to my colleagues, uh, this is the damage that's done uh, when we don't make long-term investments. If you want to talk about competing with China, uh, it's, it's in having a strategic vision that you can carry out also with our soft power. And I think we should you know, keep that in mind. So I do want to ask about um, Secretary Kuttenbrink and Undersecretary Estevez. We're seeing further integration of China's civilian and military industries as their uh, policy of civil military fusion continues. And as more and more dual-use technologies come on the market, how do we effectively control exports of these products and technologies uh, to China? Uh, yeah, let me start off with, with that. Uh, obviously, we look at this all the time. You know, uh, as I talked about earlier in the advanced fabrication semiconductor area, we just cut them off from the most advanced semiconductors uh, because I can't tell whether it's being used for a benign activity, you know, a gaming system, or for artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence for military applications. Uh, so we just stop it. Um, and then after that, it becomes a little bit of like assessing company by company whether we see them facilitating Chinese military use. We'll stop that. Specific technology areas, usually in the advanced technology area, we'll stop that. Things around quantum computing, for example. Uh, so it's, it's, we have to assess the technology, assess what they're doing with it. And if we're likely using it for those type of applications, we want to ensure that they're not. Yeah, tough to know the difference. Everything to add, sir? All right. Well, Congressman, I'll just say thank you for the question. Very important. Agree that it's the civil mill fusion that, that poses the real threat here. It's why the U.S. government, including my colleagues in Commerce and elsewhere, have taken these targeted steps to prevent China from getting its hands on these technologies that assist its military modernization and which threaten our national interests. Thank you. Are you back? Thank you, Mr. Allred. With that, uh, I will recognize Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's known that China obviously has a lot more debt than we do, up to $20 trillion more debt, yet they have a smaller GDP. My question is, how are they allowed to use this money that they basically fabricate by manipulating their monetary policy without a true central banking system like we have that when we call the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, most people understand it's neither federal nor the reserve, um, but yet China gets away with having a fake monetary policy and spending trillions of dollars per year more than we do around the world, expanding their, their global presence in the Western Hemisphere, expanding their military, expanding their technologies on this, while simultaneously investing near a trillion dollars in our national debt, which we pay interest to their economy with. Why do we allow that to happen, and can Congress do something about that? Congressman, thank you for your question. I'll have to take that back because uh, matters of currency in the global economy, I think it would be best uh, if I take that back to colleagues at the Treasury and elsewhere to come back to you. But, uh, but apart from the monetary questions that you've asked, obviously the whole focus of our conversation here today uh, has been uh, trying to counter uh, the malign influence that we have seen posed uh, by the PRC in, our, in a range of areas, and we've tried to address that. But I, I think it's safer, sir, that I take your monetary question and currency question back. Here, here's what's upsetting me, because I've been asking this for about two months to multiple government agencies, multiple congressmen, uh, about something that's as central to the future of America and the global security as anything, which is money. Money is power. Money is what develops technologies. Money is what buys military power. Money is what buys strategic influence on foreign national governments. And they've literally been cheating for at least a decade, and they've run up $20 trillion more debt than us. I'm going to emphasize that with a smaller GDP and that the world doesn't see this as a house of cards that needs to crumble. They don't have the inflation that they should have with that. They don't have a normal monetary policy. And for a decade, nobody's asked that question. How do we not know the answer this far into it? $50 trillion into a question, we don't have an answer. And this hasn't been, this is not a new question. I don't understand why we have to go back to staff to ask a question that's very fundamental to the existence of our influence strategically to the rest of the world versus a rising power that's cheating. 
I appreciate your question, Congressman, but I, I'm, I'm confident in uh, my areas of expertise and areas that are outside of my area of expertise. I'm going to take that back. I commit, I commit to you. We will get you an answer. I get it. I, I'm just, uh, it's frustrating because it seems like um, everybody asks has the same answer, and, and, uh, and I'm not really sure who to ask anymore. But with that, I'll yield since nobody has those answers. Understood, sir. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. With that, I'll recognize Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Crittenbrink, uh, I want to start with you. I'm going to move down the line. You mentioned in your testimony about the three core pillow, uh, pillars of the uh, U.S. strategy, invest, align, and compete. Seems to me, however, that, uh, frankly, our efforts have been meager compared to the Chinese efforts when, uh, when we look at what they're doing to invest, align, and effectively dominate economically in the world. Uh, Mr. Nathan noted in his testimony some examples about U.S. investment uh, globally, and he noted two specific examples, $150 million loan to Ecuador to expand and modernize a container port, $48.4 million to the country of Georgia to expand and modernize a port there. Uh, but when I look at uh, some of the uh, transactions that China is doing across the world, $1.4 billion in loans to Djibouti, $6.7 billion in loans to Pakistan, a $1 billion of loans to Montenegro for a highway project, $3.1 billion in Chinese investments to the Dominican Republic, which effectively cut ties with Chi Taiwan over that. Um, would you agree that China is flexing more economic muscle around the world and as a result is influencing the foreign policies of many countries in a manner inconsistent with the foreign policy and national security goals of the United States? Congressman, what I would say is that we're very confident in the capabilities and the tools that we bring to the table. We, uh, we have different capabilities and we play uh, a very different quote unquote game. China is in the, in the game of, of state backed loans and state directed uh, enterprises. Uh, what we stand for is catalyzing primarily uh, U.S. private sector investment, which is uh, unrivaled uh, across the world, just in my region of the world and in the Pacific, uh, a trillion dollars in American investment. Uh, across the, the Indo-Pacific larger than, than, than any other country. So uh, that would be point one. And point two, sir, I, I would say that uh, we've also tried to uh, demonstrate to countries that the downside uh, oftentimes of signing up to those loans and those projects by the Chinese because you have to be careful about the debt trap you might find yourself in. Again, concerns raised by another member on the quality of the infrastructure and uh, also the labor used in them. And then third and finally, uh, my colleague Mr. Nathan isn't here anymore, but we do uh, obviously strive to offer alternatives, but I'll go back to point one. Uh, oftentimes we try to catalyze U.S. private sector investment rather than state-led. And I certainly understand that. The $7.4 billion from fiscal year 2022 that Mr. Nathan uh, references in his uh, testimony uh, does seem uh, meager compared to what the Chinese are doing across the globe and is having an effect, no doubt, on the foreign policies of these other nations. I want to go back to what you mentioned, though, about uh, private sector investments. What are we doing to, if anything, to incentivize private sector companies to effectively unwind with their economic ties to China? Um, I would say what, what we're doing, sir, is uh, we're taking a number of steps uh, to try to make sure that through our economic engagement with China that our national security is not uh, undermined. And so we are looking at ways in careful, select, narrowly defined ways uh, to achieve those goals. But we are not pursuing uh, decoupling. Uh, we have a $750 billion trading relationship uh, with China. But I think the point that we're making here today, both uh, particularly my, my colleague from Commerce and talking about end of the list uh, decisions and other regulatory tools, is we're trying to take narrow targeted steps that prevent China from using those interactions uh, in particular to increase the capabilities of the PLA that would uh, endanger American national Secretary security. Estevez, I want to pose a question to you as it relates to targeted um, aspects of, of how we deal with China economically. In my district, I hear all the time that um, as it relates to the, the entity list and export controls against Chinese companies, that companies in my district tell, are telling me that China easily escapes this by, escapes, escapes these restrictions by setting up dummy companies in other nations and running through their exports through them. They're also telling me that when they get caught, there's really not much teeth to this 
and these individuals behind these attempts simply go set up additional dummy companies and continue on with uh, getting around U.S. law. Do you agree that additional enforcement and prevention measures are needed to stop Chinese violations in this regard to undercut American companies and American law? Now, thank you for that question. Uh, we have a fairly robust enforcement uh, capability in the Department of Commerce. You know, just the other day, I think yesterday, we uh, fined a company $2.8 billion, revoked their export privileges for violating export controls related but, to China. But did you get to the individual behind those companies so they couldn't move on to set up new companies? This was companies? a U.S. company that violated export control law. Same question. Uh, did you get to the individual behind yeah, the company? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in this case. Now, there is a bit of whack-a-mole out there. Companies uh, put up a facade. We go after that, and we'll put that company on the entity list as well. Uh, I can't stop people from being, uh, you know, doing illicit things, but we're going to go after them when we do take uh, action. Yeah, I would suggest that we can and we should take additional hard action against the individuals behind those uh, those actions. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moran. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Isa. Thank you. I'm going to follow right back up on that question. That $2.8 billion fine. Did they successfully export sensitive data? They exported data that was in violation of our export controls. So they succeeded, and you're now fining them. That's correct. So in the game of whack a mo what you're saying is, is after they've succeeded and they try, well, in the case of, of software, we know they try millions of times a day, but they certainly try in the case of hardware hundreds or thousands of times every day, and they succeed sometimes, and you succeed in finding those who do it sometimes. Is that fair assessment without adding too much either way? I also stop shipments from going. Sometimes so, you catch them in advance. That's correct. That's, those are the successes, the, the best part of whack a mo But often it's reactive, not proactive, correct? We try to be as proactive as possible. Obviously, when someone breaks the law and I catch them doing it, we take action. And it's unfortunately after the fact. And, and currently, you punish U.S. companies effectively because, by definition, you cannot pun punish the Chinese company who lives to fight another day and try to circumvent the law another day. Well, I would certainly entity list the Chinese company. Okay. Let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, what do you think the most important transnational challenges are facing the United States in its China relationship? Well, you know, from, from the commerce, from the export control universe, it is their uh, chase after dual-use technology for military modernization through their civil military fusion strategy. And does that, does that and should that define the U.S.-China relationship in a major way? That, that is part of the China relationship. And again, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink to uh, answer a like, would, would greater answer perspective. It? Yeah. Yeah. But, Brief, but, briefly ask, answer in another direction then, uh, Mr. Secretary. How would, you, would you say there's something different than that answer that is equally important? Yes, yes, sir, Congressman. If I understand your question correctly about transnational challenges, I, I, would, I would list several. Certainly climate change would be one. Uh, certainly food security would be one, pandemic disease would be another, proliferation so, would so be another. So you would list those that I've got on the board? Uh, I would, um, yes, I would. Okay, well, that's for 90 fact, minutes. That's for 90 minutes when the president met with President Xi. That's all he talked about. He did not talk about the export relationship. He did not talk about the stealing of intellectual property. In other words, to China, this is what the president thinks, not your partner there's uh, recognition of a constant and pervasive attempt and success in stealing from America. Congressman, I would say that the meeting, the most recent meeting between President Xi and President Biden in Bali was wide ranging and exceptionally candid and covered uh, a much broader agenda than just the transnational challenges that you've listed there, sir. Okay, in the remaining time that I have, I'm gonna go back to the BIS for a second. Uh, you know, Secretary Ashu worked very hard for his uh, nearly four years to, uh, uh, to limit what China got. You're doing the same thing. Both of you have successes that you can point to, and both of you have uh, 
those failures where you get a fine, but money doesn't make up for the fact that China succeeded. Let me ask you a, a, a larger question for a moment. It's outside your jurisdiction, but it's not outside your mandate. Every day in America, thousands of Chinese nationals come here supposedly for an education. I just left the Science Committee several hours there on the same subject. China is constantly sending over spies, either uh, official spies or would-be spies in the form of students. You have no authority over limiting them within your jurisdiction, but according to the dollar figure, over half a trillion dollars a year, isn't that probably the greatest leakage of sensitive, futuristic data, not what you're dealing with on a daily basis, which is important, but in fact, the technology that they're stealing as a matter of policy, uh, particularly using the people they embed in our universities? Uh, thank you for that question. First, I do not want to leave the idea that all Chinese students are Chinese spies. Uh, well, but all Chinese students are, have family back in China and potentially are, are raked for their knowledge in the future. That's well established. Basic research is not subject to our export controls. However, certain technical data is subject to our export controls. We have a university outreach program. I wrote letters to every university that does big research universities uh, and offered uh, expertise from our export control officers to come in and talk to them. We go out regularly. I was just out at universities talking to them about how they can protect the technical data that is subject to export controls. And for the record, would you follow up with an answer to the question of should you, in fact, have some form of jurisdiction over universities and, and that should that be added to your portfolio, if you don't opine on that? I, I will follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Issa. With that, I will recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Self. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to congratulate everyone that's still here. We'll call ourselves the survivors. Uh, we do have votes in just a few minutes, so I'll make this quick. Um, I just returned with the uh, chairman uh, from Germany, Poland, and Ukraine. There's a lot of media attention on the funds that we are providing to Ukraine, are they being properly, uh, do we have proper oversight over them? Uh, and I think we ought to ask the same question to some of the funds that we've provided to uh, the State Department here. Uh, you may have heard that the chairman indicated that part of the um, Countering Chinese Influence Fund was used to fund a bakery and other examples like that. Um, we also have the CHIPS Act where, so we have committed to something like a billion and a half dollars over the, last, uh, the next five years uh, for the Countering Chinese Influence Fund. And we've also committed to 500 million, so that's well over $2 billion. Uh, my concern here is measurable objective standards for the use of those funds. Now I've heard a lot of <coughs> Uh, I've heard the phrase, take steps, often in this hearing this morning, uh, but I'm interested in the measurable objective st uh, standards that you use because obviously we have uh, mounting debt deficit in this Congress. It will be one of our primary uh, objectives to get a handle on that. So can you share with us the measurable objective standards that you use for the use of the U.S. taxpayer dollars. Congressman, thank you for your question. I first want to thank Congress for providing these funds. We think that countering the PRC uh, influence fund is a very powerful tool. It's something that is used to counter Chinese influence globally. There uh, have been more than 100 projects approved uh, over just the, the last two years. I'd have to come back to you, Congressman, if, if you're looking for more details and, and more um, instances of success. But uh, I do know that, that through these programs, we've been able to uh, influence countries to resist uh, Chinese attempts to uh, get them to uh, sign on to uh, five, their 5G, for example. Uh, it's also been used to make sure to highlight 
the issues uh, uh, involved in, uh, in forced labor, uh, products produced using forced labor uh, coming out of Xinjiang. But I, I'd be happy to take that back, but we think it's a powerful tool. It's one that we take very seriously and that we we'll use, we think, very judiciously and effectively. But I'd be happy to take your question back to come back in more detail, Congressman. Thank you. I'm not looking for uh, success stories. I'm looking for the measurable objective standards that you use as the guidelines, uh, the guide rails for the use of these funds. And since I do have some time remaining, uh, something that we've not addressed today that I'm very surprised has not been addressed is uh, what are the diplomatic actions that you're taking against the uh, Chinese uh, basically annexing waters well beyond their international waters in the South China Sea? Because that is, uh, in my mind, a dangerous uh, precedent that we are allowing to happen. So what diplomatic actions are you taking against that? Thank you, Congressman. Another very important question. We are deeply concerned about Chinese activities uh, in the South China Sea. Many of their activities and many of their uh, positions have no basis in international law. I would say we're doing three primary things, uh, both on the diplomatic and the military front. First, uh, diplomatically, we're engaging with partners across the region to make sure that we all stand up for defending international law. We stand up for freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. And we ensure uh, that when countries make their claims, that those claims are based uh, in international law. And it's through that diplomacy, we also uh, point out many of the destabilizing actions the Chinese have taken, including harassment of other countries, uh, of their boats, of their fishermen, and, and the illegal reclamation that they've carried out in the South China Sea. Secondly, both the State Department and the DOD have very significant programs to build the maritime capacity of our partners in the South China Sea, building their maritime domain awareness, building their security capabilities so they can understand what is happening in their own waters. Uh, better deter threats posed by China and also ensure that they have access to the minerals uh, in their waters to which they're rightfully uh, entitled. And then thirdly and finally, uh, uh, we support the operations of our colleagues at DOD who regularly exercise both presence operations and freedom of navigation operations to make sure we demonstrate that the United States of America will fly, sail, and operate everywhere that international law allows and that other countries should enjoy those same rights. Those are the, the, the top three activities, sir, that we're carrying out in the South China Sea. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Self. Uh, gentlemen, again, I really appreciate your time uh, and coming today. I had noted in uh, your Assistant Secretary's statement that you said, uh, to reiterate, we seek competition, not conflict. Can you define conflict for me? Well, yes, sir. I, what, what we're referring to there is we welcome competition. We think that's healthy. Uh, um, that this is what we do uh, as Americans. What we don't want to see is some kind of a miscalculation that veers into conflict, uh, potentially uh, military conflict. That that is what we're seeking to avoid, uh, and we're trying to make clear competition does not equal conflict. No, understood. Line. So your definition of conflict, though, is from the kinetic element. It is not discussing the economic resource, cyber, and other types of blind activities that the PRC and the CCP are engaged in currently. As we know that China is continuing their road and belt initiative, they have a geopolitical alignment between China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, whereby they are already seeking to utilize Ukraine as the Eurasian expansion. They are taking over Mariupol and the waterways, Africa, Oceania, recreating the maritime silk route in an attempt to try and cut off Western Hemisphere supply chain while simultaneously controlling the ports as we talked about in the uh, waterways as uh, Ms. Salazar discussed in Panama, which would essentially cut off all of our supply chain. Now, in addition to this, we also know that they are continuing to buy in the billions, farmlands and other areas around our military bases, and we continue to see where they're utilizing billions of dollars in intellectual property theft from American businesses. They are continuing to try and utilize surveillance and espionage techniques. So do you not determine that that is, in fact, conflict? Congressman, I would say that we share your concerns uh, over many of the activities that you But the question is, is do you consider that conflict? Um, the, the way that we have used uh, conflict in the way that I've Just defined yes no, it a moment ago is Do you consider is, that is to kinetic. be conflict, or do you consider that to be, in any way, a conflict from them to us? What I consider that to be are unacceptable steps that pose a threat to our uh, national security and other interests to which we are responding 
proactively on a daily basis. Understood. And just to stay on the topic of unacceptable, you did talk about the egregious and unacceptable human rights abuses that are across China. We know exactly what they're doing with the human rights abuses against the Uyghur. We know that they are illegally doing organ harvesting, uh, that they have denied Hong Kong of the one country, two system framework, that they are in conjunction with Iran and Russia from an economic support perspective. Um, why is it that you don't view decoupling an adversarial nation that is out to uh, try to eliminate the U.S. dollar from the global currency and remove us from being a superpower? Why would you not advise that that's good to decouple? Well, uh, Congressman, again, <clears throat> as I hope we've made clear here today, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have uh, deep concerns across a whole range of activities, including several of which that you have outlined, and we are responding to them forcefully. But our policy is not to pursue uh, decoupling. Our policy is to respond uh, to those and counter those behaviors in the way that we think uh, best serves American uh, national interests. Do we, uh, as America, determine that Iran, we labeled them as a state sponsor of terrorism, is that correct? That is my understanding. So what would you call then the nation who actually helps to support and fund in a proxy utilization? What would that country then be? Would that not also be a state sponsor of terrorism? Again, Congressman, I've tried to outline here that where we have concerns with Chinese uh, behavior and actions, we've taken resolute steps uh, Sir, to Sir, I'm just asking a them. simple question, which is that we already have defined that Iran is a state sponsor of terror. If another nation is in conjunction supporting that state sponsor of terror, does that not then also lean to them doing the same? I'll just say, Congressman, we'll, we'll respond to the actions uh, of China that are of concern to us, and we'll do it in a way that supports our national interests. No, that's understood. And again, our national interest seems to be on the ideas of what is economically beneficial. Can I ask a question to, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Schiffer? How much money does USAID invest in China? Uh, we don't invest any money in China. No programs, no projects that are being done in China at a taxpayer's expense? Uh, there are programs that we undertake to support uh, Tibetans uh, and others who are victims of uh, China's oppression and human rights violations. So we will allocate and spend money to help the people in China who China will not help, but in return we will also continue to give hundreds of billions of dollars in trade to China while they sponsor countries like Iran, who we have noted as a state sponsor of terror, or Russia, who is uh, engaged in war in Ukraine, but yet we still won't determine that they are a nation which we are in conflict with. We won't decouple, we won't stop and, and actually hold them accountable, noting that they're an adversary. Is that, is that my understanding of everyone's testimony right now? Well, I, in terms of the programs that uh uh, that, that we support and be happy to talk to you more about them in a, in a different setting. Uh, we believe that it's important for the United States to stand up to oppress people who are victims of uh, human rights violation, cultural genocide, and, and more. And, and I completely agree with that. I think we should always be trying to help those who are uh, engaged in human rights abuses or denials. Uh, one question, do you believe that TikTok is a threat or a national security issue? And this is for everyone on the panel. Um, Congressman, on, on your, your previous question, I would just say, obviously, we're taking a range of resolute steps that we've outlined here today to advance our national interest and push back on concerning Chinese behavior. On, on TikTok, I think you're aware uh, that uh, we've banned the use of TikTok on all uh, US government uh, devices. Uh, my understanding is CFIUS is looking at a number uh, of steps related uh, to TikTok, but I think it would be safer uh, to uh, refer questions to Treasury in the CFIUS process regarding those details. I would also say TikTok uh, is a threat, and like uh, Secretary Quittenbrink just said, CFIUS is uh, adjudicating that process right now. Thank you so much, gentlemen. With that, I will recognize Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Burchett, but close. I appreciate it. Hey, it's close enough, all right? Yeah, it's close enough. Um, I fear that the U.S. government has been compromised by the communist Chinese. Um, our own president, when this surveillance balloon, or whatever you want to call it, flew over our country,
the um, the president called, uh, from what I, the earlier reports were that he called for it to be shot down, and then her own, from what I understand, General Milley said, no, it should not. Uh, and then it was allowed to transverse the entire continental United States of America, and came over my area, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I believe Y-12, uh, in that mix. And, um, you know, and he was the same general under President Trump at the end of his um, in his uh, presidency that actually spoke with the Chinese, apparently, uh, unbeknownst to the White House. And this is the same man who is telling our president not to shoot this thing down. And uh, Leon Panetta, former CIA director, former chief of staff under Obama, he w I saw him in an interview and he said he would have shot it down over Alaska. Um, I say that just as a preempt doesn't have anything to do with my questions, but it's something I think that needs to be said. But um, Secre Secretary Estevez, I'm concerned about the possibility research conducted at ORNL, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which may result in matters of national security, could fall into the Chinese Communist Party's hands. And I know Oak Ridge is part of the Department of Energy, but does the Department of Commerce have export controls in place to stop this from happening? And I believe they're calling for votes, is that correct? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, go ahead, brother. Uh, that's a, it is a better question for the Department of Energy. Uh, I doubt that Oak Ridge is exporting anything to China, but we certainly have controls around nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear goods, <laughs> nuclear-related items going to China, full stop. Okay. Um, Secretary... Crittenbrink, Brink. How do, is it, did I say your name right, Crittenbrink? Yes, sir. Okay, I got it right. Thank Birch, you. They can't get Birchett right, but we can get <laughs> Crittenbrink right. I know you all woke up this morning and thought, gosh, we're getting to go to test top for Congress. This is going to be great. Um, there are many researchers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory with ties back in China. And these people are very loyal folks. And they're good folks. But what is being done to protect these researchers and their families from Chinese Communist Party influence? From what I understand, that they, people will get approached, not necessarily at Oak Ridge, but they could be get approached and they'll say, hey, you got family back here. Basically, they imply they're going to disappear, which is greatly within the possibility of communist China. Is there something to be done about that? Is there something we can do about that? Congressman, thank you for your question. I, I will have to take that back because I don't know the details of that program, but I'm happy to take that back. Would you please do, you not, just do the, not just use the usual? Yes, sir. Um, I realize it's the 435th most powerful member of Congress. I'm not at the top of your list. No, but no I, sir. I'm happy I to. Could that. I respond very briefly on the balloon as well? And I yes, had the sir. opportunity to mention earlier, Congressman, we, we detected, we tracked the balloon. The president ordered that it be taken down, uh, and that was done as soon as it was determined it could be done safe, safely and not in a way that rained debris. Uh, down potentially on top of the heads of American citizens who could have injured or killed them. I would also say that at the president's direction, uh, we took a number of steps uh, to shield ourselves from any vulnerability from that balloon. Uh, we learned uh, a lot from that balloon by tracking it, and we're going to learn even more now that we have taken it down and recovered the debris. Yes, sir. I fear that with it dropping in salt water, the electronics would be fried and also... Um since it, uh, you know, it could have been dropped in Montana, the Democrat U.S. Senator from there even said it should have been dropped there. Uh, I said this jokingly, but it's the truth. There, you know, you dropped it off the coast of Myrtle Beach, you're more likely to hit some guy with a mullet and a tie-dyed T-shirt riding in a shrimp boat than you were to hit somebody in Montana. I mean, you, you've got all these computer models, and you can tell us where stuff drops. To me, that's just very hard. To, I'm not calling you a liar, but I am calling somebody a liar because – they're not telling us the truth about this thing, and it's the type of thing we'll never hear about. If we do, it'll be in some expose later, and then, you know, and nobody will, nobody will bat an eye. Well, Congressman, again, I'll just say that when, when the U.S. military and others did this modeling, that was the precise concern. You have a balloon that's 200 feet high, and the, the payload, the, the collection apparatus is the, the length of three buses. I, I realize uh, you that. You shoot that down from that height, debris we have scatters models over a very wide can, field. We have models yes, that can read the... The date off a dime on 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 you know the pictures mounted Yankee Stadium. But real quickly, is China? I know China's involved in the fentanyl crisis. Is the State Department doing anything to combat that? And I'm out of time. I realize, but if you can just answer that. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Maybe have somebody come to the office and get to We will. Fentanyl is an absolute scourge. We're engaging the Chinese aggressively, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we're engaging our partners to collectively put pressure on China to take the right steps that they should. We'd be happy to brief you, sir. I wish you would. I hope you all just lock them down, because I do not believe they have anybody's best interest. In this. And I worry about the good folks in Tennessee that have family back in China. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Mr. Burchette. With that, I will recognize Birch. Birch like the tree and et like I just ate dinner. Et. Birch. Yeah, but if I say it correctly, you won't correct me. Burchette. What is that? Come on. I'm giving you the French version. Mr. Lawler. Thank you for correctly pronouncing my name. Uh, Secretary Estevez, um, earlier this month, uh, Chairman McCall and I sent you a letter uh, requesting information on the Department of Commerce's implementation of U.S. export control laws. Uh, regarding uh, Chinese exports to state sponsors of terrorism. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that a copy of the letter be entered into the hearing record. Without objection. Between 2010 and 2016, Chinese company ZTE illegally exported tens of millions of dollars worth of U.S. origin equipment to Iran, clearly violating U.S. sanctions and export control laws, and I'm sure this is not the only case of illicit activity. Uh, what has BIS done to enforce compliance with enhanced controls on state sponsors of terrorism? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, on ZTE, of course, ZTE is under criminal yep. penalty re regarding their uh, violation uh, of law there. Uh, tracking trade from China to other uh, benign act or, or malicious actors in the world. Uh, you know, we can track the trade. What that is and whether there is American content in those items is harder to discern. So we have a 10 percent de minimis rule for stuff going to a state sponsor of terrorism. So we're doing an assessment of what we can do there. Uh, that's the most I can say at this point, and obviously we are going to respond to your letter. Thank you. Uh, is BIS able to conduct end-use checks in China for diversions of uh, two state sponsors of terrorism, like Iran? Uh, we are able to, use, to do end-use checks on our goods that go to China and how they're being used to ensure they're not being diverted from China. China exports going out are not subject to our end-use checks. However, we can ensure that you know, if, if they're exporting stuff from the United States, we can start to, you know, do an assessment of how much content there is. Do you believe there are certain technologies that we should not be exporting to China? If there's technologies that we should not be exporting to China, my job is stopping those. So uh, my view is no, but uh, technology advances, and we're always taking action appropriately. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Crittenbrink, I am uh, deeply concerned uh, with recent reports uh, that China may be sending ammunition and other military equipment to Russia in support of its uh, war against Ukraine. How is the administration working to prevent this arms transfer, and how would the administration respond if a deal uh, goes through? Congressman, yes, you're right. We are deeply concerned that our understanding is China is considering taking steps to uh, provide lethal assistance to the Russian military uh, in Ukraine. We have not seen them take that step yet. We've tried to signal very clearly, uh, both in private uh, in Munich and then publicly, uh, our concerns. We've talked about the implications and the consequences if they were to do so. Uh, and we also know that many of our like-minded partners uh, share those those concerns. So I think we've uh, I think we've made that uh, very clear. And, and if I could, Congressman, yes, for dual use items that are part of our sanctions package, our export control package that we and 38 other nations have put on regarding support to Russia, we have put 12 Chinese entities on the uh, entity list for providing support to Russia. Thank you. Um, as we all know, the CCP has been conducting vast espionage operations in our country for years, uh, long before this most recent episode with the Chinese spy balloon. Uh, what specific steps are the, is the administration taking to counter uh, China's espionage efforts, 
uh, over the past two years. Congressman, I think it would be safer if I take that back uh, and have colleagues in the uh, intelligence community brief you uh, in, in a classified setting. That would be great. Thank you, sir. Um, lastly, um, how is the administration working uh, with the Asian countries to push back on China's militarization of the South China Sea? Yes, sir. Um, well, I'd say uh, a couple of things. First of all, our engagement with ASEAN, the 10 countries of ASEAN, soon to be 11, is really vitally important to the United States. Collectively, these, these countries uh, form the world's uh, fourth largest economy with 650 uh, million people. Our, our collective 1 billion people, I think, have a bright future together. But specifically with uh, countries in ASEAN and especially the subset of ASEAN states who are South China Sea claimants, uh, we do several things. We're engaged with them diplomatically to make sure that they uh, and all countries promote the peaceful resolution of disputes, the respect for uh, international law, including uh, 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 international maritime law, and that we work diplomatically to preserve the freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. Secondly, we are providing both the State Department and DOD uh, uh, a great deal of assistance to build these partners' maritime capacity, including their maritime domain awareness capacity and defense capacity so they better understand what's happening in their waters. They can better deter uh, China and others from violating their rights and they can better secure the minerals in their waters to which they're entitled. And then third and finally, we work very closely with our partners at DOD who on a daily basis are through their presence operations and freedom of navigation operations demonstrating that we'll fly, sail, and operate anywhere international law allows and every other country should be entitled to the same right. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony as well as the members for their questions. Uh, the member of the committees may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we would ask that you respond to these in writing. Pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length of limitations. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.